This happened recently, I was house sitting for my folks while they were at front site. The room I was staying in is off the front porch, detached from the house. I can access the house from the sliding glass door, and another door to the kitchen, on the fourth day, I woke up at around 1 am after, I'm assuming, hearing something moving around in the house. The house is a fair distance away from the others in the neighborhood, and it was pitch black out there, so I grabbed my CZ and a small flashlight and went to take a look, the walk to the kitchen door was extremely scary, as I had no idea what was going on, it was dark as hell, and I couldn't hear any noise anymore. It was very quiet outside, too, no animal noises, no wind, nothing. I had left the flashlight off, as if there was something inside I didn't want to give away where I was if they were armed, and I was regretting it at this point. I realized, a bit belatedly, that I had not taken my glasses with me, which meant that past 20 feet, I can't see much. There were no lights on in the house, aside from a blue nightlight thingy in the living room. I opened the kitchen door and edged inside. The layout of the kitchen is that you can see down the length of it, through a small laundry room, to the hallway from the porch door. I didn't see anything, so I turned and closed the door behind me, when I turned around, I see something on the edge of my vision, at the end of the laundry room. As I said, my vision is pretty awful, so at first I thought it was a coat hanging on a hook, but there's nowhere to hang any coats there. It was very dark, and stood immobile. I'm ashamed to say I froze for a few seconds, unsure of what to do, as I felt terrified to a degree that still feels unnatural. I then realized that I was holding both a gun and a flashlight, and flicked on the ladder while shouting who's there? As soon as my light came on, I felt an immense pain in my head. It felt like someone had taken a dremel to my temple, and you know that high-pitched noise older TVs make, that kind of machine whine, kinda like that tinnitus ringing? That shit was suddenly deafening. I dropped both the gun and flashlight as I doubled over, gripping my head. I don't know how long I was like that, but if I had to guess it was a few minutes at most, when I regained my senses, I fumbled around for my gun and found it a good 15 feet away from me, near where I had seen whatever the heck it was. I grabbed my flashlight and flashed back towards the doorway, but there was nothing there, it took me a good half hour to work up the courage to get my gun back. There was nothing wrong with it when I picked it up, other than that the safety was off, and I know I had left it on when I came into the kitchen. What happened to it, I dunno, but as soon as I had my gun I ran my giant self back to my room and sat there for the next 5 hours, until the sun came up. No way I was getting any sleep, told the folks when they got back, but it was news to them. I was hoping it was something they'd experienced, but unfortunately no luck there. All I know is I'm not sleeping there anymore. Not mine but one from my grandfather. Be in Italy in 43. Be setting up shop in some hellhole farmstead outside of another town they're trying to push into. Slit trenches and shit everywhere but most of his unit holds up in a barn for the night on the farmstead. Barn is lousy with lice, nobody can sleep. After about three hours of trying to sleep my grandpa gets fed the heck up and goes to the trench outside with the guys on watch. Wakes up about two hours later to the farmstead being shelled to hell and the barn struck dead the fuck on through the roof by a shell. And even half of the platoon dead. Him, his lance corporal, and the machine gun section, six of twelve men, just walk to their captain a mile away the next morning and fill him in and get reassigned elsewhere. Grandfather told me the story about eight years ago and it never ceases to freak me the hell out that lice are the sole reason I exist today. I don't have an Inwood story, but I've got one from when I was rear-ended last Sunday on my way to work. Be on four-lane highway doing about 35, 40 miles per hour. Minivan in front of me slams on their brakes to try to make a left turn. I slam on mine. Dude behind me hits me. I have no clue what to do, so I start back on my way to work. Other guy leaves the scene too. As soon as I got hit, feel like there's a comforting presence in the car. Look over. Nothing. Check rear view mirror. Nothing but cars. What's going on? Suddenly get the feeling it'd be a great idea if I called my mom. Call my mom. She picks up her phone, presence disappears. No clue what that could have been. 2nd grade and 6 to 7 years old. Wake up on Saturday. In bed. See a silhouette of a 40 year old man with a relaxed pose, elbow on door hinge foot crossing on other standing looking away from me whatever dot jpeg looks at me knock out wake up two hours later too spooky for me 
Bimei. Seven years old. Digging in a tub of toys. Can't find my damn inner tube Ernie figurine. Hear a gravelly voice behind my ear. It says my name. Stand up and calmly nope away. Walk down to the living room. Stay out of my room until bedtime. Never found my damn toy. Damn demon jacked my Ernie. Be last week, 2 a.m. Browsing weird stuff as usual. Get hungry. Go to the kitchen. Grab some bread and jam. Splatter jam all over the bread. Head towards room. Damn, forgot to shut the pot. Go back, shut it, put it in the closet then go back to my room. Greater than two hours later, get hungry again. Go to the kitchen, grab some bread. The jam is on the table, opened. I live alone. Ask friend if he knows anyone who had access to some tools I needed to finish a project. Says sure, he knows a guy from work that would be happy to help, apparently he was interested in the same kind of art. But warns me he's a bit off. Drive friend to work one day, he introduces me. Guy seems really distant and withdrawn, shakes my hand and we chat a bit. He seems real interested in the woodwork I was doing, and we talked about sculptures and such for a little while, things we'd learned, tools we used, etc. Guy warms up a bit, and I ask him if it would be alright if I checked out some of his stuff. He hesitantly agrees, kind of like when you're trying to come up with an excuse, but just can't. He tells me to swing by that night, we can chat over a few beers. Okay sure. Later that night I get a call, it's the guy, he sounds a little shaken up, says things chaotic at home, and right now isn't a good time. Says he'll call me sometime. Whatever sure man. Greater than two weeks go by. Guy calls one afternoon, says things have settled down, and he wants me to bring over some of my works as well, to compare and blah blah blah. Sure dude so I start to head over, and notice this guy lives in the middle of nowhere, I had to call him up just to find his house. It's at the end of a long driveway, beautiful acre plus of land, the driveway is littered with trees, and his house is actually pretty nice. As I come up the driveway, something strikes me odd about the trees I'm passing up, they all have faces carved into them facing the driveway. Twisted, pained faces. I didn't think much of it, I make morbid stuff myself. And in fact I was very impressed, the amount of detail was staggering. Looking out onto the tree lean of the property, every tree had pained face looking in on the house, almost like the woods were watching you wherever you were. This actually kind of creeped me out. Looking out was like seeing a hundred or so white faces, just crying out. Kind of like they wanted your attention. Knock on the door, guy answers with a beer in hand, and a much friendlier demeanor than before. Helps me carry some of my stuff in, and he shows me around. Guy seems pretty cool. Begin to notice each room has one of those same damned faces hanging above the door frame, the more I saw them, the more I felt sick. Up close the faces were more detailed than I had imagined, almost surrealistic. I asked him what his focus on the faces were for, and the guy kind of tensed up and dodged my question. Upon entering his workshop, which was real sweet by the way, he seemed to have other interests besides creepy faces. Entire seven feet sculptures of women, men, animals, etc. All very well done. And one with a tarp in the back, just chill in there, he says it isn't done yet, so I don't bother. It was right in front of a door that I think led to another room. We begin working on stuff together, trading stories and times we had accidentally injured ourselves. Suddenly subjects change. Guy asks me what I think about God. Tell him I'm not very religious, but I don't rule anything out. Guy starts getting a bit loud, saying that God is a blatant lie, he was told so. By who? He kinda silenced for a moment, and then abruptly asked me if I believed in spirits. Gave him kind of the same answer it's possible. He starts looked around the room, as if seeing if anyone is around, and then his voice goes soft, and he kind of whispers for a moment. I see things in the woods, at dusk I can see their shadows, sometimes they whisper from the trees, and I can hear them. Nope. Obviously guy is mentally disturbed. Egg him on, ask what they tell him, etc. They tell him that God is a lie, only thing after death is darkness. 
he says they laugh at him, and leave dead animals at his tree lean. Officially creeped out at this point. He said for a while they visited him at night, and each face carving represented a different spirit that had visited him. Says that they can't stand looking at themselves in death, so they don't step within the tree lean, thus why he has the entire thing carved out. I'm pretty silent at this point, I hadn't had goosebumps so bad since I was a kid. And chills just running up my spine. He told me they talk to him from the tree lean at night, and try to get him to leave his home. I eagerly try to change the subject. Guy looks down and just keeps talking, he's pale as a sheet, and was obviously genuinely terrified. He even kind of looks like he's welling up. Tells me I'm the only person he's told, knowing I'm a stranger he apologizes, says he's scared and doesn't know what to do anymore. I try my best to awkwardly console this stranger, and the guy actually kind of starts to break down. I think he needs help. But it's not my place to give it to him. Regrettingly ask him why he's afraid. Says the faces don't work anymore, and two weeks ago he had some something terrible in his living room. Hi. He walks over to the tarp sculpture and pulls the tarp off. To reveal the most mangled, terrible thing I have ever seen. It hardly resembled a human being, it was terrifying to have imagined this guy seeing it standing in his living room. Shortly after a loud bang on the wall to my right. I nearly jumped out of my skin, this guy didn't even flinch. Then again bang then it just continued on and on, continuously, like hail hitting a tin roof. Guy screams stop it. And it ceases. After that I grabbed my stuff, tell the guy I'm sorry, and got out of there as quickly as possible. As I'm leaving his home and driveway, I look into the review mirror, the tree lean is darker than I've ever seen. Guy calls a week later and apologizes, says he was silly and everything is okay now. Friend says Guy quit, never hear from him again. B16. Sitting out on deck at my old house. Live in rural area, the school is nearby. Old hunters would hang out in the gas station and drink coffee in town which is basically an intersection. You get the gist of it? Anyway, be on deck sitting in one of those big plastic chairs enjoying fall. One of those that looks like it's supposed to be made out of dark green planks that obviously isn't wood. Getting dark, sky is all orange and pink to my left. Here beat up truck pull up to my right in gravel driveway. Keep in mind our driveway twisty and is a fucking quarter mile long. Truck door opens and shuts. Hear footsteps. Home alone, dad shouldn't be home for another hour and a half. See old guy with a scraggly beard and a limp comes up to the base of the stairs. Knowing where I live, he's either inbred or a war vet. Excuse me, sir. His voice was really weak sounding. Yeah? Is there something I can help you with? I'm looking for my dog. You ain't seen one around here have yet. I don't think so. What's it look like? She's brown, I think she's a lab mix. She ain't got a collar but she's got one blue eye and one brown eye. I'm sorry sir, but I haven't seen a dog like that around here. He looked real defeated. Wanna give me your number and I'll call if I see her. Yeah sure, that'd be good. Get his name and number. Wish him luck and tell him he'll find her eventually. Is almost to his truck before he turns back around. Hey, you're still her spoil aren't yet. I hate when people would do this, creeps me the hell out. Yeah, how'd you know? You got them eyes, like you're ready to kill something dot. Woot the health Isis noog. Okay. I'll see ya around. Okay. Drives off. It's already almost dark out. Go inside and lock doors. Mention it to dad when he gets home. Gives a weird laugh, like it's forced. Yeah, some people are like that. Like what? Nothing, don't worry about it. Remembered something else. Be like in fifth grade. Have only one friend because kid in third grade started calling me dummy and it stuck. Also I was probably the most awkward kid in my class. Only friend is a girl my age named Connie. We were good friends. My mom and her mom were good friends. 
Her and her family would come over and hang out in our pool and we would go over for cookouts at their place. Good times. Often we would come over late at night on Fridays and me, my sister, her, and her brother would play hide and seek in the dark. They lived on this back road that got you to the nearest bigger town after a while that was the alternative to the highway. Behind their house was this big cornfield. Whenever we'd play hide and seek, we'd stay in their yard and hide under stairs, behind trees, normal stuff. The cornfield was sort of an unspoken off-limits thing between us. I doubted our parents would be very fond of us venturing out in a cornfield at night with no way of knowing how to get back. Anyway, one Friday night we were playing our third round of hide and seek and I was it. Like all good kids I counted to 100 as fast as I could before opening my eyes. When I finished counting I hollered the usual here I come. Started looking around for them. Back then I wasn't as spooked by the dark as I am now, not sure why. Thought I saw the outline of Connie's little brother behind a tree next to the cornfield. As I got closer turned out it was just flayed bark. Mutter fifth grade profanity under my breath and start to walk away and look elsewhere when I hear Connie giggle from the direction of the cornfield. Sounded really close to the edge of the field and, knowing Connie, it took a lot of guts for her even to get close to the cornfield, much less step into it. Assumed that she was running out of places to hide and as a last ditch effort hid in the field. Get closer. See where some stalks have been bent over because the moon is so bright. Well this will be easy. Start following trail of bent stalks. Twists and turns a little bit. Start getting anxious because this is a little farther that I wanted to go. Go to turn and leave but as I'm following the trail back, a cloud covers the moon and I can't see anything. Panic. Start running, pushing through stalks trying to find my way out. Feel the leaves sting as they cut at my face. Gotta get out of here. Mom. No answer. Help. Mom. No answer. Keep running and shoving over stalks for what seems like hours. Scared to death, tears burning the cuts on my face. Way off in the distance I hear sirens. Start running toward them because I figure that's where the road is. Sirens cut off but I keep running in the same direction because I can see the flashing lights reflecting off the clouds. Finally see the back porch light of my friend's house. Come out of cornfield to my mother on her knees, bawling in front of a police officer. She's surrounded by everyone including Connie. Mom. She looks and starts running toward me. Oh thank god. She hugs me tighter than she ever has, pulls away, and slaps me. Where the hell have you been? We were playing hide and seek and I heard Connie in the cornfield so I went looking for her and mom, I just dash. I couldn't stop the tears. Mom tells me Connie was the first to let our parents know that she didn't see me looking for them. Claims she never went into the cornfield. My sister vouches for her since my sister could see her behind one of the bushes from her spot under the stairs. I didn't go back over to Connie's house after that. Post Spooky in a Woods Stories My story Be me Greater than 16 years old Screwing around in the woods behind my neighborhood Got my Ruger 10 20 seconds with me cause you bastard made me paranoid It's a nice little bit of forest in the middle it'll stretch for miles in any direction Be near the creek in the forest just chillin Now it should be known that occasionally coyotes and bobcats roam the forest along with cattle Hear something rustling around across the creek. Feels like I'm being watch hair standing up on my neck. About 50 yards to my left I hear a bunch of splashing in the creek followed by rustling in the grass and trees on my side. Nope.jpg. Stand up and slowly make my way out of the forest facing where the sounds came from. See a shadow move through some of the trees. Daaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaa
about 15 meters away from the spot there is a dead deer corpse with throat chewed open. Stuff like this is everywhere in a woods, don't ya worry privates. Nighttime. Get some info from the radio about wolves in the area. Don't think much of it. Morning. Get back to observation point where two privates have been for a half the night. They tell me that they didn't see anything but heard growling near them. Had an order to leave the area. See that the deer's carcass has been pretty much shredded with teeth and there is blood and guts everywhere in the observation area. I just spent the last hour reading this entire thread and I know it's dead, but I have to post. I don't really frequent slash x slash that often anymore and I've never heard of skinwalkers before, besides that one weird Louisiana pick. I know what this is, though. I've had this happen before. I'm going to post what happened my sophomore year of high school, so just hold on. There is a ceremony called the shaking tent ceremony. Skinwalkers use this as the essential tool. But, it's only as powerful as the people will it to be. The Western Indians, don't know the true potential of this ceremony. People who use it for fear, always always end up on the bad side of karma. This is a holographic universe, and there is a dark matter side to all our souls. We call this ceremony the Jiskin and practitioners are called Jiskinini they were seen as exorcist of sorts, but, with control. Consider these people to be more like martial arts masters than, scary stupid illusions you all see, I live in a small cityish area, where there's skyscrapers next door to farms and protected forests and whatnot. I live right near, practically in, the biggest forest. It's no more than 4 by 4 miles, so pretty easy to walk all the way through in an hour or so. My friends and I grew up just wandering around there and playing in the woods. There were three of us, the two besides me were brother and sister. Our parents used to joke around that we were getting back to our roots and whatnot, since it turned out we were all descendants of the same tribe. There were other kids around, but we were the only ones that went into the woods. All the others were too freaked out or something. We would always have our dogs with us, too. Now and then they would freak out barking over some squirrel or a deer or another hiker. But sometimes they would freeze up and just start growling lowly. We'd sometimes see black shapes darting through the trees. Not even from peripheral vision. We would all be staring at the same spot and see something was by. When we were younger, we would jokingly chase after it. I don't know why, looking back we were probably the stupidest kids ever and I'm surprised we weren't killed some way or another. Anyway, we never actually saw an exact something I think by the time we could to 5th slash 6th grade, we had learned to just ignore it and not really care. We've all stayed friends through the years, but branched out a lot too. I was friends with a lot of people and kind of spent different phases of life concentrating on one group, and during this particular summer, I had fallen in with a lot of potheads. I didn't even smoke, I just liked hanging out with them. Most of them hung out around my neighborhood because it's basically just the city's magnet for potheads. One day, like the last weekend before school ended, one of my friend convinces me to have a big camping party at my house, since the only way to get to a ton of campgrounds is by cutting through my yard. It was me, my friend, and her younger sister. We went during the day and set up camp only about a third of a mile from my house. Tons of food, sleeping bags, tents, the works. We wanted to have a bunch of people there. My parents weren't going to let that happen, though, so we ended up having to make five different trips with just our phones for light, trying to sneak people in along the trail. By midnight we had about 15 people there, which was a pain in the ass to keep quiet. We were right on the river and close enough to my house that sound carries pretty easily. The only two people not consuming narcotics were me and my friend's sister, and we ended up drifting off to sleep pretty early, at around 2 am, a bunch of people had to go home, so they woke me up to guide them back. Another five people, including myself, were sleeping at the campsite though. I was still sleepy, so I agreed and brought them as far as the road. When they all life, I realized I didn't ask anyone who was staying to come with me, so I had to walk back alone. It wasn't a big deal for me because I wasn't afraid of the woods at all. I started going back and I was about halfway there when I slipped on a rock that I tried jumping on and scrapped the bottom of my foot on it, I hiked barefoot. The trail is only a couple steps away from the river, though, so I went over and soaked my foot in the cold water. I was there for about two minutes trying to see how bad the cut is in the dark when I heard someone running along the trail and trying to crash through all the branches alongside it. I crouched down and I saw my friend's sister trying to scramble through the woods, so I stood up and call out to her. She tried to turn towards me but lost her balance and fell onto a root, scrapping her knee too. She was out of breath and was trying to look around for me, so I guessed her eyes hadn't adjusted at all from being away from the campfire. I told her where I was and walked over to her. I kept watching to see what this is, but I was also starting to get scared. I could sense it standing off the path, 
but almost near it, towards my left more. I started to growl loudly at it and warn it off. Everyone else just kind of hung back. Finally I could kind of make out its shape through the trees, crouched down, and I started screaming that it was a person. All my friends started screaming too and in the chaos I couldn't really hear if the guy left or not. I started yelling out anyway. I figured it was probably one of our friends had come back to mess with us, even though it had been almost 45 minutes since I had brought everyone to the road. At that point I had lost my night vision a bit and couldn't see him, I assumed, anymore, so I just called out in the same direction telling him that it wasn't funny to pull this kind of bullshit while we're all camping and having knives out. I heard more rustling along the path, out of sight since the tents blocked it. Everyone went quiet, everyone was tense, as if it was a horror movie and we were just waiting for it to pop out and scare us. An entire minute went by and then we heard more leaves rustling as whatever it was started walking away from the camp, opposite the direction we had to go to for my house. That was lucky, since right after that the kid who was freaking out about the cops starts whining that he wants to go home now. I was still kind of on edge, since rationally, I knew it was probably just a raccoon or something. It didn't sound like it was walking on two legs, anyway. But I know what I saw when I looked over. Not very well, but I can recognize a person when I see one for sure. I get him calm down and say that me and the other guy will walk him back to the road. That's not good enough for him, though, and he wants us to walk him all the way to where there are streetlights, the other two didn't want to be left alone in the woods either, so we all decide to go walk this kid a mile and a half away to the gas station. I was kind of pissed, since to be honest I didn't even like him to begin with. On the walk through the woods back to the street, the other guy was trying to text on his phone, and by the time we get out he got his brother to come pick him and the other kid up leaving us three girls to camp out in the woods on our own. I got kind of distracted by being annoyed him, so all my jitters went away. We left them there to sit out in the dark until the ride came. When we got back to the campsite, we decided to stoke the fire up one last time and eat a bit more before sleeping. We were laughing pretty hard about one stupid thing or another when the shrill scream sounds out of nowhere. It was my friend's scream, though. And she was sitting right next to me. No smell this time. I don't know why. It wasn't a raccoon or a screech owl or something else that I would be able to recognize right away. It was mimicking her, and it was too big to be some kind of escape pet bird. By now I knew for sure this wasn't a person, and it wasn't one of our friends. There's another scream, followed by the other guy's voice. He was half whispering, half gurgling, like he was about to vomit everywhere. How far away are you? Hurry up. Hurry up. Hurry up. Hurry up. Far away. Hurry up. It just kept getting closer, but we couldn't even see it yet, and we had one knife on us at this point. The younger sister started bawling her eyes out because she was so terrified. I started to screaming and cussing it out, because there was honestly nothing else I could think of. And it just went quiet for no reason. A few seconds later there was a sound like someone dragging their food against the ground, and then it broke out into a run and was gone, just like that, we packed up camp fast, and by now it's 3.45. We were on our way back when my phone starts buzzing from my pocket. I got a text from my mom, telling me to remember to lock the basement door when we came in and to stop talking so loud so we don't wake up my little sister. As soon as I realized what was going on, I called her back and told her we were still in the woods and on our way back because we thought there was someone at our campsite. She hung up right away and I saw all the lights start going on at my house. We practically sprinted back and were almost there when we heard a gun fire. We stopped, but then heard my mom screaming from the deck to get inside right away. Once we're inside, she slammed the door shut and started saying that my dad grabbed his gun and ran to the basement, but the door was open and there was no one there. He went out to one of our second floor windows that faces our apple orchard, and saw someone running away from the house on all fours, so he fired a shot, he didn't hit anything and whatever it was took off. My mom had already called the police as soon as she had hung up the phone with me. They listened to our story about hearing someone sneaking around the campsite, but that's all that we told them. They looked around, and nothing was stolen, so nothing really came out of their search anyway. My friends went home the next morning, terrified, but safe. Needless to say, they never came over again. My family kept their guard up for a few weeks after that, but everything went back to normal after a while. During the fall, some of my other friends, even some who had been there during the first part, went paintballing at night in the woods. They only spent a half hour out there, though, because they kept smelling something weird while they were out there. That's really the last time I had other people over to go in there. Whatever it is, it isn't trying to bother me. I still go there myself with my childhood friends. I keep a lookout for those flashes of movement though. I know whatever was at the campsite that night, even if it isn't a skinwalker or a goat man or whatever you fancy, it's the same thing that's always been there. I just know now to not piss it off now by bringing in other people.
Don't know but a little bit before I left for the army I would walk around at night at my grandparents, wouldn't go into the woods when it was dark but there was a road slash path that ran along a little bit of the edge of the woods, one side was woods the other a fence that kept the animals in the pasture. Eventually on these walks I started getting uneasy feelings. Wasn't really sure why but it felt like something was watching me, this didn't stop me. A couple of nights later I went out at night again and did my usual path no uneasy feeling until a couple of minutes later, on my walk back I start to hear rustling in the woods. In this area there have been sightings of mountain lions and such so I'm thinking I better get back because whatever it is it's following me. I start walking faster and it seems to be going faster, I hurry a little bit more and manage to get inside all right and locked door. Go upstairs and go to bed, thinking about this story makes me think of a bunch of other weird things that happened before this that I dismissed as animals or people trespassing but I'll get to that later, next day grandparents are awake at night in the living room. The patio door is in the living room and where I go in and out, it has a clear view of the tree line. I tell my grandparents of something following me in the woods the other night, they tell me probably a dog, coyote, coon, or something. I'm thinking I felt this feeling that something has been following me for a while and felt it the most right before I heard it following me the previous night so it most take a liking to me or just curious about me whatever it is. Turn on the porch light, grab a flashlight and tell my grandparent I'm going to try and see what it is. They tell me be careful. I get out to the tree line and just sit there for a while, enjoying the cool night air waiting to see if this thing will appear. Sure enough within 10 minutes I hear the rustling. I call hello and nothing but the rustling, ask if it's a friendly little guy. Still no response and I'm thinking that I'm silly expecting this animal to make sounds at me. Then I realize it sounds rather close, maybe just 50 feet out but keeping that distance and pacing. Turn on flashlight and point in direction, no change in sound but I see nothing where it sounds it's coming from. Think I should probably have a gun and maybe a bud to make sure I'm not going crazy, so call it a night and tell the thing good night. A couple of days later I come back from staying at my mom's house and have a friend over at my grandparents. I told this friend of what happened and that I think that it might be a dog or something but it's been stalking me for a while. Ask him if he wants to try and see if it will come out when he's around. He says sure so I tell my grandparents that I'm going to be grabbing a flashlight and the M1 carbine that my grandfather got me just in case and not to freak out so much if he hears me shoot unless it's frantic but that I'll be just 100 feet from the house. Tells me to be careful and I say me? Nah. Take friend out and we chill at the same spot I did before, wait about 10 minutes talking about random stuff when sure enough I hear the rustling, ask him if he hears it he says yeah. Good so I'm not crazy start trying to talk to it and it gets louder, sounds like it's about 50 feet away again like it was the other night. Turn on the flashlight, see nothing where it sounds like it's coming from, sweep the flashlight to make sure I'm not just hearing it one direction when it might be another. Still see nothing. Start going into the woods to try and get closer, sounds much louder now and crazy feeling and goosebumps like before when being watched and followed. Sounds about 20 feet away, shine light. Still see nothing, see nothing moving, no out of place leaves. Friend and I are like WTF, maybe it's rather big and just sounds like it's that close and tell him if it's that big then I'm not sure we should go much farther in as if it's dangerous we are fuck getting out of here in a hurry, woods were pretty thick but not hard to see, just a crap tone of briars and limbs. Wait a little bit longer still hear it and see nothing. Friends like man this is making me really uneasy can we go? Not going to argue with him as I'm feeling insanely uneasy only thing keeping me there is curiosity? Well, curiosity killed the cat so I agree and we head back. From then on till I left for basic if I was ever out there at night it would come around and I could hear it but I never got real close to the woods as I didn't have a rifle with me or anything. My grandfather and anyone else out there when not with me has never heard it only when I'm there. Thing is that I'm going on leave here soon. It's been over two years since out at my grandparents at night and I'm really curious if it's still there, now here comes the weird things. That smell everyone describes? I've smelt it but not in the sense that other people describe. I smelled it several times right after waking up and it would linger for a bit and some of those times actually made me sick to my stomach. Also, we had one of those portable air conditioners that you stick in windows, well one night I was just chilling watching TV laying in bed. Started drifting off to sleep and then wham. Something hit the air conditioner. Made me jump like crazy and I didn't sleep for a while, told my grandfather and we started speculating an owl, room on second floor, maybe? We checked the back of the AC and it had huge claw and gash marks on the back of it. Something tried to attack it, but shrugged it off. The other thing was when I was home alone at my grandparents when they went off to church early in the morning I was downstairs grabbing food when I saw this strange man walking by the window and around the house. Called my grandfather and told him what's up real quick and grabbed the .22 Luger to scare the guy off. 
He was nowhere to be seen and now that I recall he was walking pretty weird but could just be something else, no it's not much but weird experiences I felt like sharing. Camping out in the desert with two friends. Find a WW2 dig in. Decide to sleep there for the night. Friend 1, John, wakes me up, machete in hand and covers my mouth to stop me asking questions. Points to friend 2, Jane, who is asleep, with a large cut on her arm, blood dripping down. John crouches and walks up to the entrance as quietly as he can. Freezes for a good two minutes before standing up and walking back inside to grab the first aid kit. Wakes up Jane and binds her arm in complete silence. We're asking him questions like crazy and he's dead silent. He folds out a camping chair behind the entrance, facing us. Sits down, gripping the machete handle tightly. Just tells us he saw something and to go to sleep. His voice is so weak and low. Jane and I sleep facing each other, giving weird looks. Hear John moving around and fiddling with metal. Don't sleep at all. Suddenly there's a massive burst of light. John is standing in the doorway with a burning torch and machete, looking out. He detaches his utility belt and launches himself out into the desert. Jane goes after him. Grab the hunting knife from his belt and follow. Jane is following a weak flame in the distance. I'm following the occasional light from the reflective strips on her shoes. Stop at the top of a dune. See John and his torch sprint up a dune like it's nothing. Lose sight of both of them. Sitting alone on top of a dune, scared as hell. Greater than 20 minutes go by and I hear John calling from camp. Anon. Jane. Repeating over and over again in this deep, booming voice I've only heard once before. Suddenly keys hit my chest as come to the camp. Get Jane and start the car. Start freaking out and yelling that I don't have her. He gives me a look somewhere between blind rage and terror. Go to the car. Start it. Keep it running. And do not leave it. Sprint about 500 m to the car. Start it up and sit there for another 20 minutes. Wham. Huge slam on the side of the car. Nothing there. Hear smaller tap, tap, tap along the car. Oh god it's moving towards the passenger door. Can't hear or see anything. Frozen in terror. See a shape that looks as big as John come over a sand hill. He has Jane with him. Throws open the door and slides her in. Practically rips me out of the driver's seat. Barely have a leg in the door before he takes off. Jane is clutching her arm and moaning. John is going about 140 km slash HR around roads before he hits bush and begins to slow down. Climb into the back and look at her arm. Bandage is gone and the cut is bigger. Her face is scuffed up, like she fell into concrete. Dirty as hell. Wash out her cuts and climb into the front. Say sorry for getting his seats wet. He's dead silent. Notice red marks up his arms. He's shaking like a leaf. Drive for two hours. See a bottle shop sign over the hill. John makes a sound like sobbing laughter. Pull in to find it's 24 hour. He's smiling like it's Christmas. Pull in. He ditches the car, runs inside and just sits in one of the aisles, with a clear line of sight to the car. Turn off the car and bring Jane in. Attendant is asking John what's wrong. We all sit down together. John takes $80 out of his wallet and buys the best scotch he can. We sit in silence, drinking while the cashier serves a customer every hour or so, ignoring us. Look up and realize it's nearly 5 am. Considerably drunk by this point with nearly the whole bottle gone. John helps both of us to our feet and talks to the cashier. He helps us both in the car and we drive to a motel. Pass three motels until we come to one nowhere near the desert. Get our rooms. Ask John if he wants to talk. Promises he will when he slept. Wake up about nine. See Jane downstairs. Making out with some guy. He has his hand down her pants. She's still filthy. 
Don't think she slept. Walks off with the guy. Follow them around. She walks into one of the two bedrooms. Torn between a little heartbroken and a bit worried. Go back to sleep with my phone next to me and the sound of rain to keep me calm. Wake up at midday to John knocking. He asks where Jane is. Take him down to the room. Met by her wrapped in a towel with two sets of male clothes on the ground. John suddenly grabs her by the throat slash jaw and pulls her close. I told you to stay in your room. Try to get him away from her. She suddenly spits at him and slams the door shut. We go back up to his room and talk. He's being vague, but says he thinks someone was in the dig out with us. There was no blood on the floor, only on her arm. Nothing sharp to cut herself on. He tells me about growing up deep in the desert. The aboriginal families always told their kids never to sleep in the sand before the day of a storm. The miners always knocked off early before the storm. He was never allowed to go out the day before, unless it was to school in the center of the town. Finishes his long rambling explanation. Summed it up with something that lives in the desert. Think this rational scientist is screwing with me. He's completely serious. Get a text from Jane. Gone home. Check around and she is definitely gone. Keep calling her and she keeps hanging up. We decide to leave and find her at home. Go out to the car park. Walk around the passenger's side. Huge damn dent in the side. Get down close. Red hand prints along the side of the car, where I heard the tapping. Almost washed away by the rains, but still there. Tell John. He nods his head and gets in, nonplussed. We drive home. After that Jane was really odd. She slept around like the town bicycle, stopped working, stopped paying bills, started living off the guys she was fucking and became really good friends with a few of the girls who bullied her in high school, one by one. I have yet to talk to her in the three months since this happened. Move to Australia for a superior education. Make friends with a group of people in my course. Invited to go camping in the forest. Take a caravan in two tents. Stay with a friend, referred to as Jim, in a tent. He carves out a campsite a short walk from the caravan. It's about 11 pm and we leave the caravan to go to sleep. Try to fall asleep, but the noise of nature keeps me awake. Jim is asleep in a few minutes. Hear twigs cracking and footsteps. Convince him there's something out there. Rolls over and makes a hissing noise. Hear something scurry away. Just animals getting curious. Go back to sleep. Wake up again to the sound of footsteps. Make the same hissing noise. Large, loud footsteps stamp away and then stop. Lay still. Hear the footsteps slowly come back. Make the noise again louder. Wait a few seconds. Hear whatever is outside his back. Freeze. Jim, Jim, Jim it ma dash. I heard it. He's wide eyed. Get the hell out of here. He starts jostling the tent around and grabs an axe from his bag. No footsteps. He unzips the tent as bursts out. Rustle of leaves as Jim runs around. Hear footsteps trailing off behind us. Climb out and put some flip flops on. Follow Jim into the forest. Enter a really dense part. Hear cracking ahead. Jim sprints to it, flailing around his axe and yelling. Nothing there. Turns to me and tells me to go back. Hear the hissing noise again. Realize it's not just the same noise. It has my tone and whistle. I'll kill you. Hear Jim in my voice. I freeze. Jim points me back to camp and pushes me along, looking behind us the whole way. Come back for me, in a girl's voice behind us. Alex, we recognize the voice. It's the voice of a friend back at the caravan. My hiss comes comes back again. I start backing slowly along the path to the tent. See a black shape dart across the path in front. Catch a glimpse of brown and green. Can you help me, in another friend's voice. Jim walks towards the sounds. Guys, if you're trying to mess with me, I am going to call this off and go home. I am going home, in Jim's voice. Oh hell no. He sprints at me. I'm fast and skinny while Jim is fairly big and strong. He is sprinting faster than I ever could. Physically lifts me off the ground and throws me forward. 
Hear noises constantly behind us. Find the caravan. Bursts inside to ask about the shotgun a friend brought. Grabs it from the case and loads it. I tell the others that there are people in the woods stalking us. We start packing up in a hurry while Jim keeps lookout. Hear a clicking and hey in a friend's voice around the back of the caravan. Jim sprints around and fires twice before we all get into the cars and take off. Stop in town and tell the police. Insist it's aboriginal families that live near there trying to scare us. Pay for a night in a caravan park. Jim drives back the next day with a friend and his shotgun. Finds footprints with congealed blood 30 feet from where he shot. After another 40 feet the track stops. They go back to the car. Find the doors open and the objects inside moved around. Nothing is stolen. Crumbs licked from food wrappers. Saliva over bottles of water. Sharp teeth marks on an unopened pack of chewing gum. Leave it in a pile and go back to town. Ask the person running the caravan park. Gives us the same story about families scaring tourists for fun. Look online. Crime rates are two or three times worse in the area surrounding the town than they are in the town. Assault, robbery, and theft outpace any over type of crime. Almost no convictions. Google Maps show no houses or anywhere a family could live within 25, me of the campsite. Okay guys, this happened to me last night and I haven't been able to sleep since, I was hesitant to post about it on slash x slash because I've been looking for some sort of explanation or something, trying to see what it was I saw outside now that it's light out, but I cannot and it's scaring the shit out of me. I usually just frequent slash b slash, slash mu slash, and slash lit slash, so excuse me if this is something you guys have some explanation for already, Please just tell me there's a realistic explanation for this and that what happened is common, I'm terrified. Get home from work. It's almost midnight. When the door opens the home security thing does a high pitched beep 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 chime. In my kitchen eating a late dinner before going to bed. Hear a door open and then the home thing go beep 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 but it definitely sounds like it came from outside. I'm sitting right by the back door, so I go check the front door. The front door has a screen door, a wood door that leads to a small entry room, then a second door inside that leads up the stairs into the house. These are loud ass old doors. Did not hear screen door open, did not hear main door close, did not hear second door open. The door is still double locked, no other doors are opened, nobody is standing outside. Okay, maybe it was the neighbor's door, maybe they have the same system. Hear it again sounds like it's coming from outside the front of the house look out the window looks like a deer is crawling on the yard with its belly to the ground stands up on its back legs makes the door opening slash beeping sound with its head raised up to the air it is not a deer it looks like a guy with deer legs too dark to see what the hell is going on i i i i i i am who -um. what underscore the underscore hell dot jiff I I I I I I I I I am hoo -um. Sounds like a dog barking I'm home while trying to vomit. Starts galloping away across the street. Beep beep beep. Starts shaking. It's raining out at the time, the thing opens its mouth and holds its head up. Thing starts digging furiously at the grass across the street with its front arms slash legs slash things. Puts head near the hole, like it's looking inside. Keeps walking down street. Beep beep beep, I I I I I I I am who um. Puts head back to drink rain. Digs at ground. Keeps doing this down the block before galloping away down division away from the city. I do not live in a rural area, the deer population typically stays down towards Melrose Park off of Thatcher by the river, I live just outside of Chicago, literally a block west of the city limits. I have never seen anything like this or heard of anything like this. I am shitting myself right now. I was going to post this story on slash b slash but I avoid slash b slash like the plague unless I'm bored, it's summertime and I'd just get memed on left and right, and this seems more paranormal than anything else. I've been googling for similar stories and trying to find some sort of typical scientific explanation for this sort of thing but I can't even find any sort of similar story. My instinct is crazy homeless guy, but its legs bent back like a deer's, it was not built like a human being, and it was definitely not wearing clothes and looked like it had a full body of fur. I don't use drugs, I was not tired, 
I was 100% lucid and I'm goddamn horrified. Please say there is a common explanation for shit like this. Not personal stories, but stories I've heard. Story 1. When I was a child of elementary school age, I would stay at my grandma's house every weekend. It was my absolute favorite place to be as a kid because, to me, it always seemed completely steeped in strangeness. Grandma R was a weird, sweet lady who was incredibly spiritual and dabbled in Wicca every so often, I remember she used to do things like wash my hair in rainwater and chant to the full moon. My mom thought she was completely mental, but I loved her and loved staying with her because it made me feel magical. Her house was huge and fairly old, probably around 150 years. I always heard strange noises at night, a child laughing, little footsteps, creaks on the stairs, etc. I was never afraid, though. I never felt threatened by these particular spirits. They seemed innocent and never bothered me, so I paid them the same respect. I grew accustomed to the nighttime sounds as I grew older and even liked hearing them after a while. Both grandma and I talked about the ghosts and how cool it was that we were able to experience them firsthand like this. One night, though, I had an experience that wasn't so pleasant. I woke up really late at night and had to pee. The upstairs was in a U-shape, guest room, my room, my grandma's room, and then the bathroom. I was never particularly afraid of the dark or anything so I never had a problem getting up and using the restroom at night. So I quietly opened my door and started walking toward the bathroom. After a few steps I started to feel super chilly and like there was someone following me. The vibes I got weren't good whatsoever, which was unusual. I suddenly started to get really terrified, my heart was beating out of my chest but I tried to keep my cool and continued to walk steadily toward the bathroom. I finally got there and opened the door. On the inside of the bathroom door there was a full-length mirror. Before I walked into the room, I held my breath and looked into the mirror to see if I could catch a glimpse of what I felt like was following me. A few feet behind me there was an impossibly dark and fuzzy shadow, sort of in the shape of a cloak, and an extremely pale, expressionless face peering out of it. It felt menacing and angry and I almost blacked out. I slammed the door as hard as I could and locked it, turning all of the lights on in the bathroom and running the water. I stayed in there for the better part of an hour. When I finally got up the courage to leave I ran to my grandma's bedroom and slept the rest of the night with her. I never saw the figure again, but I dream about it sometimes, and it still completely terrifies me. Story 2 I am a police officer and I work in a very small town in England with a population of less than 4,000. Because this town has such a small number of people, they also have a low crime rate and do not need to be open 24-7, plus, we don't have enough workers for that, we close the doors at 8pm but continue to take calls after that. This happened around late 2011. Three workers and I were preparing to lock the doors, we were putting away files etc and I was just cleaning up a bit. I went outside to throw away the garbage while my other workers were in the storage room. When I came back, there was a boy sitting on the couch, he looked about 11 and had blonde hair and was drawing something on a piece of paper. He did not seem dangerous nor did it look like he was doing suspicious. I was sure I left without a person in there, and I was positive that none of my workers had children. Not wanting to alarm the boy by calling him out or calling my workers, they wouldn't hear me anyway, the storage room is basically the basement, I just slowly walked towards him and looked over his shoulder to see what he was drawing. He was drawing perfect circles all over the page, weird, I thought. But at that time I did not think too much of it. I'm not over exaggerating when I say perfect circles by the way, they were like the ones I needed to use a drawing compass to achieve. I figured the boy was lost because I am not from the town I work in, I would not know whether he was from there or not. Instead, I lightly coughed, asking him what he was doing here. He looked up at me and just said hiding and continued to draw his circles. 
Feeling a bit creeped out I stepped back to get my partners while continuing to talk to him, a technique I was taught, and I think I said something like those are great circles and I remember his reply perfectly, steady hands. I ran to the basement and shouted for my partners, they were putting away some files and asked me what was wrong. I was about to tell them that there was an odd boy upstairs when one of them was in the process of putting away a picture of what looked a lot like the boy. I asked to see the picture and I had been right, it was exactly the same boy. I was not crazy, even though at that time I was extremely skeptical, but one of my talents are remembering and recognizing faces, this had to be the boy. It turned out to be a wanted picture and I asked the backstory of him, he was so young to be a criminal. Jason, one of my partners told me that the town called this the case zero and it had to be abandoned 25 years ago because they never found the boy, Alder Buckley who was only 11 years old when he killed his parents and little sister. Just with one bullet. Story 3. My girlfriend and I just started our adult lives by moving in together. I'm 20, and she's 19. One night we had fallen asleep out in the living room while watching a movie on the couch. I heard something coming from the bathroom in our master bedroom, almost like something had fallen out of the medicine cabinet. I woke my girlfriend up as I got up from the couch. She looked up at me and smiled, where you going, babe, she said sleepily. I told her I might have heard something, that it was probably nothing, and I just wanted to check on it and she nodded and dozed back off. She had looked a little off, a little pale a little sick. That entire situation was just weird. She wasn't usually one to be so happy to be woken up. I shrugged it off and continued to the bedroom with caution, unaware of what had made the noise. When I opened the door and turned on the lights, my heart sank to my feet. There laid my girlfriend, sleeping peacefully in our bed. I tore the covers off of her. She sat up and cursed me. It was something along the lines of what the hell are you doing, why are the lights on, can't you see I'm sleeping. I explained the situation and she irritably explained that she woke up early in the morning and moved to the bed because it was more comfortable. She shrugged it off saying I was probably dreaming and imagined her with me on the couch when I first got off. But it was so vivid. And that didn't explain the noise I heard from her room. To this day I have no idea what happened that night or who was with me on that couch, but I know what I saw and I know it was real. Camping out on one of the islands in the NC Outer Banks. Only brought my .38 because I wasn't planning on hunting. Boats anchored, pack is ashore and I do a sweep of the little island for the pigs that these are known for. Find nothing, but in all honesty didn't really look much. Set up camp. Cook and eat some rice and cornbread. Go to bed. Wake up to pitch black because I hear a pig making some god awful noises and some splashing not far from me but still out of view. Get up, throw my shit in the boat and sleep in there. Pig probably just got nabbed by a shark or stepped on a skate. But it was kinda spooky. Guess I'll do an og one, cause this is the worst green text thread I've seen, so, I guess my mid green text will be okay. Be me, wagey with a terrible job. Have to wake up next day at 6am. In bed at around 11 p.m., exhausted, but I can't sleep. Mess around on phone for a while. Around 1 a.m. now, say screw it, I am just going to lay still in a position with my eyes closed until I force myself to go to sleep or I will KMS in the morning. Even though I still feel restless, and my mind can't shut off, my eyes are really heavy. First time I've ever felt like this. Despite wanting to move, I don't. Eventually start hearing voices, just random shit, at first it startled me, but I was so tired, I just started to ignore it. Voices saying my name, random numbers, random sentences that didn't really make sense, don't care. Shut the hell up, I want to go to sleep. All of a sudden, sharp ring in both my ears, like MW2 flashbang, I shoot up out of my bed. It's really hard to move, like when your leg falls asleep but all over my body. Edges of my vision are jagged with black. Convinced I am literally dying and need to get help. I feel 100% awake, this is reality. My feet feel the wood of the floor. 
I see myself in my bedroom mirror opposite of my bed. Make my way to my bedroom door, to tell my roommate to call 911 or to help me or some shit. Grasp doorknob, have to use the full force of my body to open the door. Doing this, I lost balance and fell into my closet. I'm on the floor. Can't get back up. I say, screw it, I'm dead. I was 99% sure I was awake, but out of a type of desperation, hey, maybe this isn't it. I clawed on the floor to grasp it. Realize it has the texture of my blanket. Wake up back in my bed. Tweak out and tell roommate about what happened. Said he heard some type of crash in my room minutes before. Most slash x slash thing that happened to me I guess. Hello slash x slash. I have a story to share. I beg your indulgence on the preamble, but I want to get it all off my chest. Not quite a green text, but close enough, I hope. This takes place just over 10 years ago in rural West Virginia, tucked away in the Appalachian mountain range. I suppose that's what attracted my grandfather to the area. He and my grandmother were immigrants from Eastern Europe and proudly referred to themselves as mountain people. It always seemed a strange thing to me to be proud of, but it did make them tough. Tough enough to survive World War II and escape the USSR on bushcraft skills alone, and maybe a bit of luck. The only thing of value they had besides the cloths on their backs was his cross. They were also a superstitious people and I suppose some of that rubbed off on me, too. I grew up on stories of ghosts, beasts of the forest, and cautionary warnings to look out for signs and port ants, particularly in dreams. By way of example, my father's godmother swore that at certain times she would hear a broken grandfather clock chime at odd hours which foretold the imminent death of a family member or friend of the family. That this was taken at face value with nary a gainsay should be sufficient to demonstrate what kind of people they were. Or, perhaps more accurately, we are. In any event, that love of the mountains led my grandfather to purchase a piece of land in the middle of nowhere West Virginia and build a cabin practically from scratch. He was quite the handyman, how he made a living, and my dad lent me and my younger brother to him on more than a few occasions to give him a hand. Just about the only thing he hired someone to do was a fireproof the chimney for a wood-burning stove. I spent plenty of summers growing up as a kid and then later a young man at that cabin with him either hunting or messing around in his workshop. Even after he retired, he never stopped tinkering. That's why, when he died my senior year of high school, I stopped going for a couple years. His death hit me hard and I think part of me didn't want to see that cabin without him here. He had left both the cabin and his cross to me in his will. Anyway, two years of avoiding the place, I think, is what caused my younger brother, let's say Yvonne, to force the situation. He tells me that he's promised his girlfriend, let's say Lena, a fun week during winter break in a cozy little cabin and it's my job as his brother not to cock block him. Utterly trapped by this irrefutable logic, I relent. To my surprise, however, there was a fourth person. One of Lena's friends, a shy girl we'll call Sophia, was there too. I didn't put two and two together then, but the other part of Ivan's master plan to get me out of my melancholy was introducing me to Sophia. He's a simple guy, but the best brother anyone could ask for. We packed up our stuff, clothes, gear, and a few guns between Yvonne and myself. He had my dad's .308, and I my M4 and a .22 for target practice. The drive up was uneventful, thankfully. Mostly chatting with the majority of the conversation carried between Yvonne and Lena while I drove. As reluctant as I was at the start of the trip, the crispness of the mountain air was the most invigorating thing I'd felt in years. The car had to be parked about few miles from the cabin, making for a brisk hike uphill. Naturally after a mile or so the girls dumped their luggage on Yvonne and me, except for a small backpack of books Sophia refused to be parted from. At that point I had her pegged as the consummate bookworm who would probably never leave the cabin. The path up was overgrown from not having been walked in over two years so Yvonne and I took turn chopping or otherwise breaking branches and bushes. 
By the time we made it to the small clearing the cabin sat in, all four of us were beat and it was nearing dusk. The girls handled cooking while Yvonne and I brought in firewood from the shed for a couple of nights. Yvonne and Lena shared the loft, Sophia set up a cot in my grandfather's workshop to the side of the cabin, and I crashed in the main room on the sofa. The first few days passed peacefully and we fell into a comfortable routine. We spent the mornings lazily warming up in the cabin before heading outside to hike and explore or target practice. I had fun with that last bit in particular as I talked Sophia into letting me teach her how to shoot, letting her try the point .22 I brought. The girl took to it like a fish to water, which I hadn't expected from the reserve bookworm. She kept asking me to set up targets further out, which I happily obliged. The evenings were a mix of board games, cards, and storytelling. It wasn't until the fourth night or so that stuff started getting weird. It had snowed lightly that morning, so we spent the day inside. Yvonne and Lena had already gone up into the loft leaving Sophia and I intermittently talking about a book she'd been reading and poking fun of the pair's poor attempts at sneaking off each evening. Nothing overt happened at first, but I felt the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. I found myself looking over my shoulder towards the door every so often. I don't know if Sophia picked up on my change in behavior or felt antsy herself, but she moved from her chair to sit next to me on the sofa and cast a few glances at the door herself. A startlingly loud crash at the door made both of us leap up and Yvonne curse from the loft and poke his head over the railing to look down on us. What the hell was that? He asked me, as Lena joined him at the railing, hair more than a little disheveled. No clue, I answered honestly. But I'll take a look. I quickly got over being startled and grabbed my M4 and headed for the door. In truth, I figured something like a deer or coyote had gotten lost or something and crashed into the cabin. I opened the door and swept my flashlight across the front steps. Sure enough I saw large hoof prints in the snow in a meandering path around the general vicinity of the cabin. I was going to head right back inside when I noticed just how many tracks there were. Looking left and right I saw the hoof prints seemed to circle the cabin. It looked as though the deer had walked around the cabin at least three or four times before crashing into the door and leaving. A little unnerving, but nothing to piss myself about, so I went back inside and bolted the door. It was just a sick deer, I think. Or lost. It was wandering around the place and must have crashed into the door. Yvonne shrugged and Lena said something about the poor thing being all alone. Everyone went to sleep for the evening, but I couldn't quite shake my uneasy feeling. I chalked it up to being bored and looking for some excitement. I wish that had been all it was. The next morning was a slow one. Last night's little excitement had been all but forgotten. I had promised to take Sophia a ways up the mountain to a small overlook with a great view of range and a small valley. She packed some food for us both along with one of her books, which I teased her about, and we headed out, leaving Yvonne and Lena behind to entertain themselves. I had little doubt they'd do just that. I was grateful the snow on the ground wasn't that deep as I was keenly aware that Sophia was not typically the outdoorsy type. It didn't help that she stubbornly insisted on carrying the backpack so she could pull her own weight. Honestly, it was endearing. An hour or so later we reached the outcropping and I kicked snow off of one of the larger and flatter rocks until we had a place to sit. Lunch was had and we took in, what I will swear to, is the best damn view in the Appalachians. After a little bit Sophia took out a book and began reading while I took in the surroundings. I lost track of time as that serene moment flowed on until the dull and numb ache of my lower extremities finally convinced me it was time to head back. It had been quiet before, but now that I was active again, I began to notice exactly how quiet it had become. I scanned the area but didn't notice anything out of the ordinary and tried to shrug it off. I was on edge on the way back. Each footfall in the snow sounded louder than I liked and I stopped trying to hide my regular scanning of the area around us. I was certain we were being watched. That itch between my shoulder blades never left and I caught Sophia looking around, too. I picked up the pace and Sophia kept up without protest. 
I don't know if she was picking up on my demeanor or she felt the disquiet around us, too. I suspect it was a little of both. About halfway back an odd pattern to the brush beside the path caught my eye. Doing a double take with my head I saw four sets of branches laid out in the snow in the shape of people. Roughly doll sized, so only half a foot or so tall, they were no more detailed than gender signs for bathrooms. Two girls, two boys. Sophia said beside me, looking past my shoulder. She was pointing to what I saw now was supposed to be long hair on two of the figures. Well, that's creepy. I uttered to myself to break the silence. Sophia only nodded beside me. I could have chalked it up to hikers or campers messing around or playing games over the summer. It wasn't uncommon to come across abandoned camps or even small structures used by moonshiners. Except these were on top of the snow. The crack of a branch breaking made me freeze stock still while Sophia let out a yelp. The sound echoed before it was eaten by the snow, so it was hard to tell where it came from. My mind told me it was an animal or an old tree bough breaking from the weight of the snow. But somewhere deep down all I wanted to do was run. When the first sound was followed by a second, then third, I did just that and grabbed Sophia by the hand, pulling her along with me. The snaps turned into a crashing tumult as we bolted. It sounded well behind us at first but the path we took meandered along the sharp slopes, moving laterally as often as it did straight. Whatever was chasing us seemed to be making a direct path towards us. Fear nodded in my throat and I kept shooting glances behind us as we ran. I cursed myself for not bringing my gun on this outing, but there wasn't anything to do about that then. Sophia was gasping for breath and had my hand in a tight grip. The further we moved the more I ended up dragging her to keep the pace. With the thing getting closer I decided that we had to take a straight shot as well, or we'd be caught out here for sure. Don't let go. I yelled through gasping breath as I dragged Sophia straight into the underbrush. It slowed us down somewhat as bushes and branches whipped at us, cutting our exposed faces and snagging our clothing. We were about three quarters of the way back when a low hanging branch caught the handle of Sophia's backpack. With a tearing sound the shoulder strap gave way and the back was ripped off of her. Wait. She gasped out and dug her heels in to slow herself, trying to grab the bag. Leave it. Come on. I grabbed her wrist again and yanked, almost pulling her over but we resumed out flight. The sound of the thing following us had gotten louder but despite how still being mid-afternoon, thick brush and the rolling terrain made for very small fields of vision and at most all I ever saw was a large dark shape careening between trees before vanishing under another slope. A few hundred feet after the backpack was torn off, I finally noticed that the sound behind us had trailed off. I don't know why it stopped chasing, but in the moment I didn't care and only stopped when I broke into the clearing of the cabin, falling to me knees, panting. Yvonne and Lena either saw us come bursting into the clearing or saw us wheezing on hands and knees, but regardless they came over and asked us what happened. I honestly don't know. Someone, something, chased us all the way from the overlook. The rational part of my mind tried to explain it away are a small bear or deer that I'd magnified in my panic, but I didn't really believe that. And more importantly, I wasn't going to mess around with danger to my family. Yvonne looked past us into the forested hills and shrugged. Well, let's get the hell inside. We've all had enough of the damn woods for one day. I had utterly no reason to argue with that so we all went back inside. By evening it started snowing again, and the weather, normally peaceful, seemed instead to serve only to smother every sound in the clearing. We all stayed up in the main room talking until a soft crunching of snow outside stifled all conversation. Our heads swung towards the door and slowly followed the sound. The footfalls were soft but sounded full, heavy. As it passed to the left of the door the sound dropped off, as the wall of the workshop added a bit of a buffer, but we picked it back up again against the back wall of the kitchen. Crunch. 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 None of us wanted to move, we simply followed the sound with our eyes as it circled the cabin. Once, twice, 
thrice it circled before Ivan stood up and shouted. Screw off, asshole. This is private property. I'll shoot you for trespassing if you don't screw off. His shout caught us off guard, not only for the sound but because he said aloud what I suspect we'd all been thinking. We weren't alone out here anymore. The crunching stopped at his shouted challenge for a few moments then a series of thunderous blows rained against the door. They sounded like sledgehammers pounding into the weathered beams. The girls shrieked and one of them, I'm not sure which, started crying. Ivan and I looked at each other and up at the loft where we had the guns. He practically leapt upstairs while I grabbed my belt knife and told the girls to get into the workshop and close the door behind them. Before they could move, if their trembling legs were even able to move, Ivan was back downstairs. He tossed me my M4 as he fumbled with the bolt on his rifle. I'm warning you. We're going to shoot if you do not leave right now. I tried to keep my tone level, to sound more angry than scared, but I'm certain I failed. Whatever was outside either didn't care or didn't understand, but regardless paid the warning utterly no heed. Ivan's eyes met mine with I nodded in affirmation. Sophia saw us lining up our guns on the door and covered her ears, Lena following suit. I put one slug through the door while Ivan did the same before quickly racking another round and pulling the trigger again. Despite the ringing in my ears, I heard a scream, or a howl, or both, that made my blood curdle. Malice and pain melted together before fading as whatever it was retreated away into the night. The sound of my thumping heart filled my ears until that too finally subsided. Slowly I made my way towards the door and whispered for Ivan to cover me as I set my shotgun down next to me, squatting at the door. I peered into the largest hole left by our rounds and didn't see any movement. With slow movements I opened the door a crack and looked into the pitch black. Not seeing anything, I opened the door halfway and swept my light once again. Viscous, deep red, almost black patches of blood stained the snow in front of the door and a mess of those same hoof prints from the previous day. More dark splotches on the wall of the cabin caught my attention. Four figures were painted on the wall in what looked like blood. Two boys and two girls. Scrawled alongside it in a sloppy hand were the words give just one. I think up until that moment I had been hoping for a rational explanation, but one of those folk tales I grew up on at my grandfather's side was right here in the forest with us. I closed the door and bolted it tightly, taking a moment to relax my breathing before turning around. It's gone, now. I said, simply. I don't know where it went but we did hit it. I think it's bleeding. Hit it? You mean I didn't blow its goddamn head off? Ivan demanded as he looked from me, to the door. What do you mean it? Lena whimpered as she gripped Sophia beside her. You said it was just a deer yesterday. Just a sick deer. Maybe it was it the same deer that chased you today. Rabies can do that, right? I avoided her gaze and instead pointed upstairs to the loft. Look, I don't know what it was other than that it was dangerous. A rabid animal or a crazy person, or whatever. It doesn't change that we're leaving at first light, understood. Ivan sighed and nodded beside me. Right. Screw this shit. Tomorrow morning. It's probably going to bleed out and drop dead, anyway. Asshole. He sounded more confident than he looked but I didn't argue. You girls go upstairs, Ivan, and I will sleep in shifts to keep watch. I said and gave Lena a gentle push towards the stairs and motioned for Sophia to take her up. She flashed me a plaintive look, but went up with Lena. When the girls went upstairs, I motioned Ivan over to door and told him what I had seen outside. Against my advice, he demanded to see it for himself. He stepped outside and a minute later came back in looking more than a little pale. It's a goddamn psycho, man. We're out here with some axe murdering hillbilly. I didn't feel like arguing the point that what I now felt with us on this mountain felt far crueler and darker than any meth head woodsman. Ivan and I split the evening in half, with him sleeping first. I don't know if anyone was actually able to sleep, but the cabin was deathly quiet, 
regardless. I kept my M4 across my lap, the cool metal more than a little comforting. The only change outside was the wind eventually picking up. The front which had brought the most recent snow had arrived and started to clear the clouds overhead. A creak on the stairs made me jerk until I saw the sheepish Sophia creeping down the stairs. She sat on the sofa next to me and scooted closer. I took her hand in mind and squeezed as she trembled. Any other situation, I would have been thrilled to have such a pretty girl clinging to me in a cabin. Let me tell you, from personal experience, it's not worth it. Any pleasant daydreams about being the hero in some horror story and getting the girl are a far cry from what it feels like in the moment. It was because I felt wholly inadequate in that moment to actually protect her. Not even mentioning whether I could protect myself. Give just one that thing had demanded. Offered. The more I thought about it the more it sounded like a bargain being offered. Give just one of us. And then what? The other three would leave safely? I shook my head to clear the ugly thoughts and focused on the girl beside me. At least I wanted her to feel safe, even if I felt helpless to actually protect her. That much I was certain of. I reached into my shirt and pulled out my grandfather's cross. I held it out in front of us, the gold backlit gently by the glow from the wood burning stove. This cross was my grandfather's. I whispered hoarsely. It's been in my family for three generations now. Him, my dad, and now me. I left out that technically it had jumped from my father straight to me, but details like that didn't seem important at the time. Three generations it has kept us safe from war, the evils of man, and evils beyond man. I slipped the chain over her head and let the cross fall around her neck. She gave my hand a slight squeeze and leaned in close to kiss my cheek. Thank you. She whispered. And it was the sweetest two words I ever heard. I don't know exactly when she fell asleep, but at some point she did leaning against my shoulder. Ivan came down for his turn on watch, clearly not having slept himself. We exchanged wordless nods and despite trying to keep my eyes open, I drifted off. While the night seemed to drag on, now that morning was here, it seemed like it came far too quickly. I was stiff and exhausted, but more than ready to get off that mountain. I was the last one awake, apparently. The girls were getting things packed while I looked around for Yvonne. In response to my unasked question, Lena pointed towards the door. He's outside taking a look around. I nodded thanks and grabbed my M4, heading out onto the porch. Cold wind cut at my face as I looked around. In the dawn light, the dried blood painted on the cabin was no less unnerving and I dreaded the girl's reaction to it. My eyes fell on the words again give just one and bile rose in my throat. With a sneer I spit on the wall and purposely turned away. Perched in the trees all around the clearing were starlings or some other small birds sheltering from the wind. Something small darted in front of the steps and I immediately raised my weapon before lowering it again and bending over to pick it up. It was a page of a book, neatly severed from the binding, with a single hole roughly punched through the center. I was about to toss it onto the ground and let it blow away when I recalled Sophia's book from yesterday. Sure enough, it was a page from that book. As I stood there slack-jawed, Yvonne came around the corner of the cabin, startling me. In his hand was another half dozen pages of the book. He looked at the one I was holding and shoved his bunch into my hand. Read it. He said stiffly. I tilted my head in confusion before flipping the stack of pages over. Scrawled on the back in runny black letters were the same words on the wall. Give just one. Looking back at the tree line, I realized those birds weren't birds. Each and every page of the book had been cut out and hung from the branches like vile talismans. I turned back to my brother. Get the girls out here now. We're leaving immediately. I was well beyond terrified at this point. Yvonne moved past me into the cabin and I heard them talking through the door. A few minutes later the three rejoined me on the porch. Lena and Sophia gasped at the sight of the cabin wall but didn't ask questions. Sophia, though, 
was transfixed by the book pages fluttering on the tree branches. I think Ivan had told them what to expect. I set out first, the girls next, and Ivan took up the rear. Despite the snow we were determined to leave and were packed far lighter than on the trip up. There wasn't a sound in the woods besides our own movement and the oppressive feeling of being watched wore on the nerves. I kept my head on a swivel and I'm certain the three behind me did as well. About 20 minutes down the mountain I saw the first sign of trouble. Carved into a broad tree trunk four stick figures were carved and beneath it the familiar words. Give just one. I started when I saw it and looked back at the three. Yvonne looked grim and Lena started crying while Sophia held on to the point two two I'd given her all the tighter. We have to keep moving. I stated in as steady a tone as I could manage. At least six more times we came across either carvings in tree bark or stick dolls of a similar type to the first one Sophia and I had found. By that point almost an hour had passed and we were well and truly freaked out. We were jumping at our own shadows. However, it wasn't much longer after that I began to catch movement to the periphery. Occasionally, at first, then more often. Guys. Faster. I didn't need to tell them why. They all had noticed it too, by that point. Any semblance of stealth vanished as we heard it crashing to the right deep in the brush. I turned and fired blindly splintering bark and bits of wood before continuing on. We were moving at a jog now, everyone panting from exertion. It wasn't a pace we could maintain the two more hours it would take to get back to our vehicle. Whenever the sounds got too close at either side, Yvonne or I would fire off a round or two and keep moving. Twice the suddenness with which the thing's movement charged us drove us off the path, wasting valuable time trying to find our way back. Our progress slowed to a crawl, especially when it would come at us from ahead, further down the mountain, cutting us off. Each time we'd try to go further, again, thwarted. it all with those damnable carved figures taunting us. Give just one. It would have been all too easy. Leave one person there and three of us keep running. That's what it wanted. Yvonne raised a hand to stop us through a particularly dense bit of brush and leaned up alongside a fallen log a good 200 feet off the trail. The girls sagged against it, sucking in air and catching their breath. The damn thing is hurting us. Yvonne growled under his breath. I nodded, eyes darting about. I know. We've spent more time retracing our steps than making progress. And it keeps getting ahead of us. Yvonne peeked over the log and wiped the cold sweat from his forehead. Keep going. I nodded. There's no choice. We can't stay up here. Eventually the food will run out. Or ammo. Or nerves. As we meant to make a break back for the path, an inhuman growl issued from somewhere ahead of us the direction we needed to go. Loud and direct crashing through the brush towards the log we were huddled behind drove us backwards. I sighted my M4 over the log, put three slugs down into the brush, and ran. Back. Back to the cabin. Yvonne yelled. The girls ran ahead heedless of thorns and branches as they rushed. Yvonne and I picked up the rear and we made a panicked retreat towards the cabin as the thing grew closer. As another howl split the air Lena turned and looked over her shoulder and went sprawling. She cried out sharply and curled up clutching her ankle. Yvonne and I skidded to a stop by her side as she grabbed onto my brother, grabbing his wrist as tightly as she could. Don't leave me. Please, please don't leave me. Give just one. Of course she was terrified of that. I waved Sophia on to keep running as Yvonne handing me his rifle, hefting Lena onto his back. We resumed running as I checked our rear even more frequently. After a few minutes, however, it became clear that the thing had ceased following us. Is it gone? Yvonne asked tentatively, slowing his pace just enough so he didn't keel over. I shook my head. No. We're just going back where it wants us to. Yvonne clenched his jaw and looked stiffly ahead but made no protest. The escape attempt had been thoroughly foiled and now Lena was injured. When we returned to the safety of the cabin, 
Ivan set the sobbing Lena down on the sofa, the distraught girl clutching at him and apologizing. This continued until he returned with snow from outside wrapped in towels to use as a makeshift ice pack for her ankle. Thankfully, it was only sprained, not broken. Dejected and feeling trapped, the four of us sat in near total silence for several hours. I decided to break the silence, if for no other reason than needing to hear a human voice. We'll have to try again, once Lena's ankle is better. We have food and firewood for at least a week, maybe more if we stretch it. But we cannot stay holed up here and giving it what it wants is not an option. Agreed. My brother snorted to himself and flashed a half grin. No shit, Sherlock. Both girls nodded, and Lena in particular looked particularly relieved. Ivan and I split keeping watch again. He and Lena slept upstairs, the latter needing his help to get up to the loft in the first place while Sophia curled up on the sofa next to me. Frankly, I found her warmth more than a little comforting. Nothing happened for several hours. In any other circumstances it would have been remarkably peaceful. At some point Sophia started stirring in her sleep, flexing muscles and jerking, muttering to herself fitfully. I was reluctant to disturb her, but when she started sweating, eyes darting underneath her lids, I gently shook her awake. She bolted upright, nearly knocked my teeth out before flinging her arms around me. I hugged her back and made soothing sounds as she trembled. It, it was in my dream. I heard it. I could hear it speaking to me. It wants one of us, any one of us. But we have to offer, have to give one. She looked up at me with teary eyes. Oh, God, I just want to go home. I rocked her gently and told her it was just a dream. I held her tightly as I lied gently to her. Ivan eventually came to take over watch I tried to sleep. It didn't last long and I woke suddenly to Ivan squatting before me, shaking my shoulder with a finger pressed against his lips. Immediately alert, I sat up, easing Sophia down onto the sofa as I stood up. He motioned for me to follow him up to the loft. By this point the wind was blowing fairly strongly and I could hear the cabin creak slightly in protest. When we reached the loft, Ivan gestured to the window and cautiously looked out. I was surprised by how bright it was, but the wind had completely cleared the sky and a waxing moon sat just above a distant ridge. It cast long shadows across the snow drifts, inky blotches of pitch black as ugly stains. At first I didn't see anything but Ivan directed my gaze towards the left and my breath caught as I saw movement. A dark figure, or the silhouette of one, was clearly visible. I can't say how tall it was, there was nothing for reference. But it seemed tall. Massive, even. The figure was willowy and lithe, and seemed oddly graceful despite its posture, which was hunched. Broad shoulders met a long torso, supported by two double-jointed legs. Its sinewy arms were impossibly long, seeming to drag almost to its knees. Its head was angular and elongated and crowned atop it sat a pair of curved horns. It moved, or rather loped, through the snow drifts, seemingly not hindered by them in the least. I don't know how long the pair of us watched it, but it was enough time for it to circle the clearing several times. Each time it vanished out of sight, we'd wait with bated breath for it to reappear from the other end of the clearing. Until, one time, it didn't. Ivan and I waited, then looked at each other, before turning to the door at the opposite end of the clearing from where we were watching. We both moved as quickly as we could and our feet just hit the bottom of the stairs as the wretched pounding and clawing started again. Sophia woke with a start and I grabbed her arm, pulling her off the sofa. Ivan. I shouted and started pushing the sofa. He got beside me and the two of us shoved the heavy wooden sofa against the door as the bolt rattled and wood groaned with each blow. Behind me I could hear Lena hyperventilating as Sophia clutched onto her. I hadn't even seen the former of the two come downstairs, despite her injury. I had the vague sense that the beast hadn't actually been trying to get in. Sheer weight alone should have been enough to splinter the old wood holding the bolt into place along with its stocking in the woods. 
it could have run us down at numerous points if it had wanted to. But that didn't make the terror clump any less in my throat. I wondered if the fear was the point on some level. I think this thing enjoyed our terror, like an appetizer. Fear was a way to hurt us mentally as it had done so mentally before. The pounding continued, as did the scraping of claws against the wood. Each blow sent vibrations though my body. I had to bite my lips till I tasted blood to stop the quivering of my teeth. Next to me, Yvonne had the same look of abject terror. Just give one. I could feel the malice behind each blow. It was suffocating. Only old timbers kept it from our throats. I turned and pushed the sofa harder against the door with my back and dug my heels into the floorboards. I saw Sophia in front of me kneeling and rocking slowly, hands clasped together. It registered vaguely that she was praying, holding the cross I had given her in her hands. She held it so tightly that it must have cut the palms of her hands. I don't think I'll ever forget that moment as long as I live. A line of red running down her pale skin, bowed head framed by matted blonde hair, as a demon from grandfather's story bait outside loud enough to wake the dead. Something clicked in me at the moment. My younger brother, my blood, was beside me. Beside him was the woman my brother loved and before me was what seemed like the most beautiful girl in the world. The thought of her torn apart by this horned beast made me sick to my stomach. Give just one? How could I sacrifice any one of them for my wretched life? An idea possessed me and I was desperate enough to follow it through. If this beast was a demon, why not fight it like a demon? I grabbed my brother's shoulder and told him to hold the door. Yvonne nodded and braced himself as I jumped up and ran to the workshop across the main room. Stumbling around I frantically scanned the walls looking for the torch and silver solder I knew should be there. I thanked God my grandfather always kept the place organized and found what I needed. The infernal pounding kept up as with shaking hands I wrapped the silver solder around the blade of my belt knife. Without wasting any time I lit the acetylene torch and began to melt the solder. It was ugly. It was sloppy. Clumps fell off as I made this jerry-rigged silver blade, but Christ if at the end I didn't have something sharp covered in at least some silver. I tied the handle of the blade around the end of the barrel on my M4 and went back into the main room. The slamming was joined with guttural growling and the digging of claws into the wood. I think something of my intent showed on my face as Yvonne just nodded at me. I steeled myself to face an inhuman beast baying for blood. Yvonne and I grabbed the sofa and yanked it away from the door with a sharp crash. As quickly as it fell, my brother put a round through the door. Then another, and another. Rage-filled howls split the air and a primal fear tried to work its way up from the pits of my stomach. I opened the door and stepped out, shotgun in heart. I suppose I expected it to be standing there waiting for me, Satan spawned to face. Instead, I caught a blur of movement to my right and crippling pain in my chest and stomach. The wind was knocked from my body and I felt as though my ribs were broken. Turning slightly under the weight I was able to kick upwards with my legs, desperate to keep this thing away from me. And thing it was. The eyes are the part I can never forget. They were onyx pits sunken into its canine face, matte and inky. From them I felt rage, malice, contempt, lust, and murderous intent. I was looking into the face of evil and it knew me. It offered me things. I don't know if anyone here has truly felt temptation. I don't mean the temptation to cut class or to tell off someone you really shouldn't. As its pitted eyes bored into me, it tempted me. It offered me things I was afraid admit I wanted. It showed me each person who had wronged me flayed and dressed in sackcloth, writhing in pits filled with salt. Give just one. It showed me a jeweled crown of ten points lowered onto my head by its bloody hands and my name echoed by a million voices. Give just one. It showed me Sophia and Lena, radiant and naked, kneeling at my feet, weaving collars of supple fig leaves about their slender necks. Give just one. I hated it. I hated it because I could not deny that I wanted it. At least part of me, did. 
it's easy to say you would never give in to temptation when the temptation is theoretical and the offerer isn't before you. I did not doubt this thing had the power to fulfill its end of the bargain. And I knew the price. Give just one. I wrestled with it as much as myself in those seconds as they dragged on. Until I thought of Sophia again. Her trembling figure, kneeling in prayer, and the slow drop of blood from her palm which clutched my cross. Shame and resolve filled me and I denied the thing. With every fiber of my being I denied it and I felt a weight lifting off my soul. It knew that it had lost me. Its prize was snatched away, and rage made it vengeful. I leveraged my legs upwards into its chest, frantic to keep it away from my throat while my right hand groped blindly for my shotgun. Cold steel met my fingertips and I gripped it firmly. As the pitch black voids descended towards me, I stabbed. I felt a moment of resistance, then the yielding of flesh. The beast shook violently and I stabbed again, heaving with all my strength I pushed it off me in time to see Ivan readying his rifle at the door. Ear splitting howls filled the night cut off only by the flash and report of Ivan firing. I don't know if he hit it and I don't think it mattered. The horn thing clutched its chest where I had stabbed it with makeshift silver and fled into the night. I knew that the demon had be beaten and it would not return for us. I don't mean to suggest that we killed it. I'm not even sure that killing it was either possible or would have been meaningful even if the body had died. Yvonne certainly thought that it went off and bled out in some gully in the mountains. It's easier for him to think about in those terms. A beast or a creature, evil certainly, but still a beast. Fundamentally mortal and as such subject to death. But he didn't see its eyes like I had, and as his brother I don't want to be the one to strip him of the innocence. It was a manifestation of evil, a spirit, or demon. It inhabited flesh but it was not of the flesh. Such things are meant to be resisted, not destroyed. At least that's what I've come to believe. As for the four of us, we're doing well. Lena is now my sister-in-law and I have two wonderful nieces. As for Sophia, she never did give back my cross. She refused to part with it for anyone but the fourth generation of my family. So, I had little choice but to marry her, of course. Our son has it now. Someday when my nieces and my children are older I'll tell them this story, too. They already hear the ones my grandfather told me. Lena rolls her eyes and tells me not to scare her daughters. But no one, not Lena, Ivan, or Sophia ever actually tell me to stop. They know children need to learn that evil is real. God bless you all and keep you. May you never forget it either. And that, slash x slash, is my story. My English is shit but whatever. Mom told me this story last year and now I have the chance to get it out of my chest so here we go. Be us, Mexicans living in the frontier, on the Mexican side of course. Have huge family on mom's side, like every Latino out there. In the course of less of a year half of the family die from health related issues slash accidents. Only three siblings remain, mom, two aunts, and one uncle. The funeral house literally have us on quick call at that point. Shit is hard but we keep going. It is what it is. Greater than three years happen and one aunt is out too, so now is mom and a couple of siblings. Cousins and more or less close relatives dreamed about them at some point when their deaths were relatively recent. Mom never believe or dream with ghost or other spooky things so she call it BS and carry on. FFWD a year after. Halloween and El Dia de los Muertos, Day PF the Dead, are literally one day after the other on the calendar. Picture it like that Disney movie Coco. It can get like that on the southeast parts of the country, here in the north we are more autistic about old traditions than our beloved southern so we then to do more Halloween than the original thing. Uncle says screw it and makes us do an altar to the memory of the dead in old grandma's house, and his new house. Never did one before or after that one so it was kind of fun to put the things they loved in life as well as their favorite food. A ton of alcohol for the uncles, cigs for the grandpa, sweets for grandma and this homemade guava candy that one great uncle loved. We stayed the night on old grandma's house on different rooms since the house got enough beds for everyone. Only light in the house are from the candles on the altar and the digital clocks in each room. 
Mom have this quirk that she go to bed and just lay on for an hour or three, eyes closed and all, and then go to sleep. If something gets her up from the bed then shit restart and she got understandably mad about it. Greater than 40 minutes passed and she could hear someone opening the door of the room. Dad is snoring like a champ and I was pretty much in the same spot on the next door. She hear slash feel someone walking on the floor as well as the sound of a plastic bag creaking with each step. Then it stopped once he reached my mom's side of the bed, just in front of her. Mom is shitting bricks since everyone was sleeping slash on bed at that time. She keep her rays closed thinking a thief just got into the house and was looking for some money or jewels. Suddenly she feel how that person lean forward and give her a kiss on her forehead for a second, the sound of the plastic bag filling the space between the two. As soon as that happened the other person leave the room the same way he come in and close the door behind him. Mom jumps out the bed and open the door of the room to see who the hell did that. She's alone in the dark just outside the room, the only light coming from the candles on the altar at the end of the hallway. She go back to bed and realize that the room smelled slightly like guava candy and cigs. She start to tear up a little bit in silence until she got sleep a couple hours after. MFW I realize who was the person who give her that kiss. Great uncle was a good fella, a party animal that loved his beer, dance, and eat this homemade guava candy when he was having a blast, even at an older age. He died from a crash accident some states out while working and moving his body to our city was problematic at that time because COVID, making dress him rather hard since the body was following its natural course, so three-fourths of his body was covered in a thick black plastic bag when it was time to see him on the closed coffin. Shit gets weird when holidays older than the own country gets involved. I don't know what it is about small towns that cause a shitload of happenings, but I have a few. I work at a hotel in a tiny ass town in Kentucky, and I'll just tell a few of my more memorable tales. Middle of the day, waiting at the front desk. Boss told me the PC in the lobby had a few games on it, just shit like Bejeweled and Solitaire. Told me not to turn up the volume though. I'm playing Bejeweled for the 836th time that day when I get bored of sitting in complete silence besides the clicks and clacks of the older than dust mouse. Turn up the volume just a bit figure boss wouldn't mind because there wasn't a single person in the lobby. Everything's chill for a few minutes. Display freezes. Does this shit regularly, turn off the monitor and go to turn it back on. Screen is on the desktop, but the speakers are absolutely blaring a really high-pitched sound. Head is pounding and hurting. Nose starts bleeding. Dive under the desk and rip the power cord out of the back of the PC. Sound stops. Pain stops. Hear a bunch of footsteps from upstairs from guests wondering what the hell the sound was. No one came to the front desk. Boss arrives a few hours later, notices the small bloodstains on my shirt. Immediately starts chewing my ass out for turning up the volume on the PC. Ask him why the hell it even happens in the first place. He has no idea, but tells me the guy who brought it in in the first place was a weirdo that was really into voodoo and satanism and other occult crap. Boss is superstitious about everything, but I'm honestly suspecting some voodoo shit at this point. I'll type up and share some more tales in a second. I forgot all about this thread for a while, whatever, here's one more. Some prick has been breaking into some of the empty rooms. Stuffing rubber gloves down the drains. Messing up beds. Cutting up carpets for some reason. Boss has me routinely checking the rooms. Making sure they're locked and so are their windows. Just finished a bunch of rooms on the first floor, motel has three floors FYI. Stopped to get a quick drink from a water fountain in the hall. Just across from the room I just checked. Hear door behind me rattle a little. Didn't startle me, usually the hallways were quite noisy because the walls were pretty thin. I immediately rush in and check out the hell was going on. For a brief second, as the light from the hall was shining into the room. Swear on my own life I see the silhouette of something hanging from a rope. People have game ended themselves in this motel before, thankfully all of the cases happened before I showed up. Shit myself for a split second. Blink and the entire room is now messed up, exactly like the way I mentioned before. Tip off the janitor. Rush to boss office. Gives me a what can you do look. Yet I've heard from the staff about that before. Rooms never got messed up after the hanging woman appeared though. Rest of the rooms were completely fine for the next three months. 
Also one more short one, I'm spending time with some mates so I can't tell any of my longer tales for now. It's the afternoon. On my lunch break. Eating a cheesy meatball sub while doing data entry crap. I'm just eating at the front desk in the lobby because my boss doesn't care and neither does anyone who's gonna spend a night here. Notice someone dash into the employees only room while I'm eating. Shrug it off as one of the janitors, there's two and one of them is a shifty bastard who's really quick. Take another bite of my meatball sub. Something hits me really damn hard in the back. Start choking. Panic and get out of my seat. Bang on the door to the employees only room while trying to dislodge the melted cheese and meatball stuck in my throat. Get shoved over by something. Spontaneously throw up. No longer choking. I'm completely terrified and panicked. Crying a little as I crawl backwards and end up with my back against the front desk. The shifty janitor comes darting around the corner, sees me panicked and crying and my shirt covered in vomit. Face turns white as a sheet. Darts away. As soon as I told my boss about this shit he let me have the week off, paid too. Flat out told me he wasn't allowed to talk about it when I asked him what the L happened that day. MFW. Be me. Work at Hellhole Fast Food Place off the highway in CT. Across the street is a gas station and after that. Woods. Mid-November of 2020, so business is deader than Blockbuster. But we can't close earlier than midnight or the store supervisor will write up the store manager, who'll in return cut hours in revenge. Highly illegal? Yes, how she gets away for cutting hours as revenge on people she doesn't like? Dunno. Said store manager is also a lazy screw-up who leaves me, and a guy named Kyle to close by ourselves. Since it's dead and we're pretty much waiting around for midnight to come we take advantage of the quiet and kill time sharing a 20 piece and playing cards. Eventually, Kyle decides to do trashes. I'm stocking the sauces and breakfast cutlery while Kyle takes trash out to the corral. The corral, for the uninitiated is a closed off area where the main trash dumpster is kept, it's not locked and has no reason to have this front gate as a person can slide through the sides easily. I'm doing my shit when Kyle comes barreling to the storefront, he's banging on the windows to be let in, later I found out dumbass locked himself out of the place somehow. When I let him in, he comes running and screaming telling me to hide in the crew room because he's not sure if he was followed. Give him some time to calm down, tells me some tall smelly homeless person was dumpster diving. The sight startled him enough to make him run. Tell him I'll go out there to talk him into screwing off. Take a flashlight and knife out of my backpack as protection, also take a screwdriver from the tool kit the maintenance man had. Approach corral where the front is wide open. And I can definitely hear it, someone is in there. I yell hey. To whoever, they suddenly rise out of the dumpster. With the flashlight, I manage to make out details like a flat nose, brow ridge, real ugly son of a gun. Like Kyle, bitch out and run. Called the cops as soon as I could. They found nothing, or anyone. Damn, I had something somewhat similar happen to me when I was in middle school. Have dream about scaring this one person in Brazil, I'm from America, so I don't know why it was in Brazil. We plan to leave them in an opening in the woods next to a single orange light. Two friends are going to dress up in 10 to 13 feet tall cryptids, supposedly from native lore in the region and come out of the woods to spook the person. Kinda looks like pickerel kek, no lame ass Egyptian shit though, body is jet black and has large red or orange stripes going down the body. I'm watching this unfold in my room over a Skype call with another person. Two creatures come out, only one of them is my friend. Hear screaming from both the person being spooked and the spooker. Other friend in the call tells me they know where I am, and that they are coming. Awaken to an insanely loud banging on my window. Like someone is trying to break the window down. I clutched a baseball bat I had in my room and sit there in my bed for 3 hours till the sun comes up. The banging doesn't stop the entire time, and has a constant rhythm to it. Eventually sprint upstairs and get yelled at by my parents. Tell them about the banging, but they say they haven't heard anything. 
get home from school that same day and check outside my window for tracks because it had just recently snowed. Nothing. It never happened again after that point. I have a second-hand story. One of my professors shared it with the class. He's a molecular biologist from Spain, so very skeptical of ghosts. But he said when was a kid he and his father stayed at a house that was kind of haunted. It's not that spooky, but it's a cute story. The gist is this. Professor's dad is in university at the time studying to become an architect. They're renting a cheap room from this old lady who lives alone. The bed has a single bed which Professor and his dad have to share. On the first night, the old lady warns Professor's dad to place the mattress on the floor, because she's worried about my Professor, who was only a wee lad at the time, falling off the bed. Professor's dad just thinks the old lady's being overprotective and tells her it will be fine. That night, the two of them wake up to the bed shaking violently. They're used to earthquakes and assume that's what it is, but then they realize it's the bed. They jump out of bed and it immediately stops shaking. Professor's dad decides to pull the mattress onto the floor like the old lady said and the two of them never experience anything bizarre like that again. Various things like this happen over a long period of time, odd little things, I'll just share one more. When the woman is going to visit Hawaii one day, she tells Professor's dad to not have any guests, and not to ever turn the music on too loud, which Professor's dad promptly ignores by having a barbecue and inviting a friend of his. They're listening to the stereo loudly when it just shuts off for no reason. It's plugged it and the electricity is working, they're like what the hell is wrong with this piece of junk? Then they see that the volume has just been turned all the way down. Anytime they turn the music back up the same thing happens, very quickly, making it seem like the stereo shut off. They decide to just leave the music off. So anyway after a ton of stuff like this, Professor's dad finds a blueprint one day. Remember, he's working to become an architect, so he's actually working on a blueprint himself for a project, but somehow it gets lost and he winds up looking all over the house for it. He ends up looking in this coat closet where he sees a ton of suits, and there, rolled up, is a blueprint. He pulls it out and it's not his blueprint, but he decides at this point, screw it, I'm going to use this for my project. The old woman comes out as he's working and says, did I hear you rummaging around in that closet, and professor's dad says yes, I was looking for my blueprint, and I found this. She says, my husband was an architect and that's the blueprint for this house. He built it for me. He died 15 years ago. So by this point a ton of minor shit has happened, from hearing footsteps in the hall, to hearing voices, to his son, my professor, claiming multiple times to have seen a man in his room. So he puts two and two together. Oh shit, I wonder if the old man's ghost is watching over this house. So later, professor's dad is visiting his brother, who is a Catholic priest and he mentions how he used to have to cleanse houses back in Spain, but he only ever did it under the guidance of someone with more experience. Professor's dad gets the idea, hey, you should try to cleanse this house I'm renting a room in, there might be an old man's spirit in there. The old lady is in Hawaii again, so she isn't there to protest. So the brother priest comes over and cleanses the house performing the ritual as best as he can recall. The messed up thing is that just before this, Professor's dad had found a new place to rent, and he was supposed to be moving out. And his move out date coincided with the return of the old lady's trip from Hawaii. And as soon as she pulled up to the house, she sensed something was wrong. She stood there staring at the house, looking confused. She glanced at Professor's dad kinda strangely and then went inside. By this point, Professor and his dad have packed all their shit into their car and they're preparing to leave. Professor's dad is about to head inside to say goodbye to the old woman one last time and thank her for her hospitality. But then they both hear her screaming from inside the house. And oh oh oh. What have you done? What have you done? Both of them get spooked, and then they hear the old lady scream, he's gone. He's gone. Professor's dad thinks oops and the two of them hop back into the car and drive away, never to revisit that house or see the old lady again. That's all. Sorry, fell asleep senpai. Be me 18. Decide to go camping, have always loved the outdoors, 
but had never been able to enjoy it before. I pack up my truck, and head out deep in the woods. Total novice, couldn't pitch a tent worth shit, constantly scared of animals. Only weapons are a crossbow, Remington 1858, and camp knife. Like a total gookball dingus I went by myself, didn't bring anyone along. Don't even think I told anyone where I was going. The third night out I start hearing noises. Rustling in the bushes and twigs breaking. I shrug it off, it was probably just an animal. Suddenly I feel uneasy. The noise keeps happening and I start to notice the animal or whatever is walking in circles around me. Get scared shitless. I curl up in the center of the tent and keep listening. Crossbow is outside. I kept the Remington with me in case of bears. I yell out hey go the hell away. In the hopes of maybe scaring whatever is out there off. I hear whatever it was quickly dart away. And I calm down. At this point I'm convinced it was a deer. The next morning. Campsite is torn to shreds. Everything is turned upside down or opened. Food is all over the floor, doesn't look like anything was eaten. My backpack was ripped and all of its contents are in the dirt. I feel a little better. I really did think it was a bear, but something in me is feeling doubtful. I check my truck and that's when I notice something is wrong. The tire is slashed, well it was probably closer to being torn. It was a shredded mess. I notice on the hood are two paw prints, but they only have three toes. I don't know what animal would have that. I'm feeling really uneasy at this point, like I'm being watched. But I think better of it and ignore my instincts. I throw on the spear and continue with my inner woods tomfoolery. Shoot a couple beer cans, fishing, and napping. Shit is starting to get weird though. I see a bird die mid-flight, and I find a dead opossum with its chest torn open on some rocks. But fish happening bro. Avi. As I'm making some ravioli a dog comes out of nowhere. He's covered in dirt and mud, but he's friendly. He's also extremely anxious. He whimpers occasionally and stares in the same direction of the camp sometimes. Okdago.jpg Decide to keep my new battle buddy, he doesn't mind sticking around. I try to give him a bath, but he freaks out whenever we got near the water. Across the creek I see something run away from the bushes fast. I get so freaked out. The thing looks 7 feet tall at least. But two couldn't make out the shape. I'm really having a hard time convincing myself it's a bear. Decide to go to sleep that night with new dog. My new dog is really friendly, he cuddles right up against me that night. It was fun. I name him Slippy. Slippy and I are relaxing in a tent. I have my lamp on and I'm reading. Slippy is being really watchful. He just scans the entire front side of the tent. I kind of get uncomfortable about it, and the watched feeling comes back. But I remind myself that he was in the wild for a long time. He probably had to keep his guard up. Slippy begins to growl, and then whimper. I don't know what the hell is going on. The circling starts happening again, now I'm shitting my pants. Slippy is panicking now. He's huddling into my side. I notice a really powerful and weird smell. It's like a combination of eggs, cinnamon, and cum all in one. I can hear a heavy animal-like breath from outside and then a howl unlike anything I've ever heard before. It's like a long drawn out scream, I'm about to have a stroke I'm so scared. I'm holding Slippy in one arm and my crossbow in the other. Something rushes the tent and topples it. Now I'm screaming. I grab Slippy, he's barking by this point, and I make a beeline for my car. It's around 500 meters away from my car, so I'm running. Fuck all my camp supplies, I'm taking Slippy and we're getting the hell out. We're running and I see something dash between the trees. It's stark white, tall, and slimy looking. And it's running toward me. I shoot at it with the crossbow, and I'm positive I made contact. It howls and runs off. 
I get to my truck and throw Slippy in the back seat. As I'm trying to start it, the thing bashes its entire body into my door. It starts clawing at the window and its hands have three fingers. I don't dare look. This thing wants me dead. My truck starts and I drive the hell out. I stay at a motel at least 30 miles down the road. Notice as soon as I get there two tires are slashed open. Whatever it was tried to sabotage me. The next morning I go back to get my stuff, I'm no more than three feet away from my truck and I keep my gun on me. The campsite is completely ruined and there are three dead animals torn open. Two rabbits and a deer. I don't dare go camping there again, or go alone. Side tone, Slippy lived for two years after and was a good dog. In a suburb, walking around at about 1 am. Midnight air cool against my skin, feels good man. Relaxed as hell. Silhouette of a man approaches. He's walking kind of fast and with a hobble. Oh shit oh shit oh shit dot xml. B19 at the time, can't cc. Dude gets in my face with a weird smile. Hey man, shouldn't be out so late. Lot of weird people about. Tactically shit brick. Dude is obviously on drugs, drunk, or both. He stands there for a few seconds, think he's sizing me up. He just bolts into this random house. Pretty sure it's not his. Nope the hell out of there. Alright typing from my mobile, and my green text professionalism is kind of off the hook. Be around 17 to 18. Hunting in the woods with my dad. Third hunting trip ever. Which mean that I could hunt on my own. Hunting in a kind of rural part of Sweden. We've got two towers on our land, one facing east, mine, one facing west, my dad's. It looks like pick related. Also close to the land is a cabin which we own. My tower is facing a creek and a field. Possible to see the lake through the woods. Possible 5 to 6 in the morning. Hear branches snap. Time to get ready yo. Put out my cigarette and scan the forest lines. Can't see shit, maybe it was a damn bird then. Still trying to scan the forest line. Hear another branch snap closer this time. Hmm still can't see shit. Look through the scope and look around a fur. WTF it's a old lady hiding behind it. Don't know if my mind is playing trick on me. Take a look with my bare eyes. Shit bra, she's still there. Don't know WTF to do. Jump down the tower and she is sprinting up too. She is screaming about everything is your fault. Decided to book it to the cabin. Look behind every 5 seconds and she's still behind me. God damn it. Mind you if I would have shot at this acres thing. I would have been in prison for attempting murder. Running on a gravel road with a sharp turn. Now it's 300m to the cabin. Run straight at it, trying to get the keys out from my pocket. Tackle the door, bumping back and trying to get keys in the lock. Bingo. Close the door shut, put on the locks, hide in the bathroom. Trying to calm down and remember that my dad is still outside. Decide to try my walkie-talkie, and his is off. At the same time I start to hear tapping on the windows. At this point I don't know if I fainted or if my brain turned off. But I woke up to my dad shouting at me. I ask what the time is, and it's 7 in the morning. Turns out his version of this is. Hear me shouting and running away. See something running after me. Thinks it's a boar at first. Run after me and said boar. Start to see it's a person. Sprint to the road and call the police. Turn off walkie-talkie and follow said person. Police came incredibly fast, just after 20 to 30 minutes. Stand at the sharp turn and wait for the police, but still having an eye on the house. Police came and he pointed at the house. Police arrest the woman. Turns out she had escaped from a, don't know the exact word in English. But an open asylum, while having a walk with other patients, drug addicts most of them, and she had a psychosis. B14 years of tender age. In a woods with friends, camping exercise for old country equivalent of Boy Scouts. Greater than four guys, Rolando, Kenny, Daniel, and me. No adult supervision because hell if they care. Shooting the shit, cooking possum, good times. 
when suddenly wild dogs machetes come out formation is assumed bricks are shat dogs circle around us barking and snarling but won't attack hebros no machetes kill this goes on for a few minutes then the quiet happened dogs shut the hell up and scamper we start hearing labored breathing and what sounds like slurred words out of the woods comes the damned thing about the size and shape of a dog but wrong front legs look much thicker and back legs just trail behind face is all screwed up most teeth missing skin looks like it's hanging off it it looks like something is wearing a dog and the sounds it made gurgling struggling wheezing rolando mutters some yoruba shit and as if activated by the sound the damn thing charges i'm in the way so it jumps at me the horror i felt at that exact moment is honestly indescribable i'm fucking trembling writing this clamps down on my closed fist with its few teeth freak scream tear up like a little bitch kenny jumps in and stabs the thing nothing i bring down my machete on its neck and it cuts through with no resistance like cutting through cream cheese or hardened lard i just decapitated the damn thing in the blink of an eye the body scampers back into the tree lean with jerky spastic motions we buried the head and stayed awake until dawn cracked at which point we hoofed it back to the main camp and requested to be excused which was denied we were only one week into a month-long survival thing spent the rest of the time sneaking under the main building to sleep at night I still have the bite mark and am extremely paranoid when camping. Be me. Be couple months ago. Driving home. Windows down good warm October. On reasonably backcountry road. Black guy on either crack or meth is in the road. Four cars and myself stop for him. Shitty pickup in front of me. Two cars in other direction nope out of here and keep going. Can't go because of pickup. I can hear him rambling about how the neo-world war II German guys and shit are taking over the gubament. I am in a white trash red mustang and sporting a skinhead haircut. He throws open the door on shitty truck. Gets in. Hear a shit ton of screaming. Guy tactically shits some bricks. Proceeds to throw his leg up and kick high guy back out. Shitty truck throws the engine up to 6000 rpm and makes some skid marks. Just me left. High guy sprints at me going at ludicrous speed. I throw it in reverse and book the hell out of there. Never heard anything about it past cop friend saying something was reported but nothing came of it. Pick is about my haircut and appearance in general. Speaking of slash K slash related dreams. Be in a dreamland. Working at a zoo or some shit. Zoo is having a kids all night event. Basically a big slumber party in the middle of the zoo. Me and other zoo staff are making sure everything doesn't get too rowdy. Have it arranged for some of the more friendly animals gives the kids a ride to the sleepover area. Distinctly remember a 25 foot plus crocodile carrying 4 to 5 kindergartners on its back. All is going smoothly. Suddenly notice 3 chimpanzees walking up the path. Have Vietnam tear flashback to a horrific chimp attack that happened a few years prior. Same chimpanzees. No 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 no. Female co-worker notices me panicking tells me to relax and give them a chance. Says they've been rehabilitated. She's a cutie read head, so I trust her. Act casually as the chimps approach. As soon as they walk past me, they begin screaming and charging at people. Slaughter begins. People are being killed and eaten by the chimps. Brain matter smeared across the concrete. Dead kitties everywhere. Cutie has a bloody hole where her neck used to be. They come after me. I go to draw my CC but I put it in my locker before work. Climb a big light tower thing to escape them. It works apparently, chimps can't climb for some reason. Don't know what to do, so I keep climbing. When I reach the top, I find my SNW shield with an empty mag and rounds scattered about. Frantically load mag, wondering if I can win a fight against three adult chimpanzees with only seven rounds of 9mm. Wake up. Freaked me out quite a bit. Anyone else have dreams where you need to use your CC, but can't for whatever reason? Third time it's happened to me. 
This is a true story that happened to me in the summer of 2014. Be me. Shooting on BLM land in California desert. Alone, only weapon I have is a trusty 1934 nugget, perfect student. Finish up my shooting and walk up onto the hill I'm using as a berm to check and collect my targets. About 200 yards away from my firing line I turn around and see a rusted out blue tow truck approaching. Its wench is messed up looks like a 1950s truck you'd expect someone from the hills have eyes to be driving. Think it's NBD, people shoot in this spot all the time, although today it's just me. See the guy get out of his truck, he's Hispanic and wearing a white wife beater that doesn't cover his stomach and jean shorts. He hops out of the cab and starts pacing alongside his truck with his eyes on the ground, looks agitated, nervous. WTF.JPG Thinking of the firing line as being the shape of a capital L, his truck is about 60 yards from my car, which is parked on the far left side of the base of the L. His truck is to the far right, while I am 200 yards north at the tip of the L policing up my targets. I begin walking back to my car, at a slight angle, keeping my eye on him, he's still pacing. As I'm about 100 yards away he glances up and sees me moving, begins walking towards my car at an angle to intercept me. The whole time his head is down and he's not making eye contact. Think this is weird, keep moving up towards my car slowly and cautiously. When he's about 60 yards from my car I see him reach into the rear waistband of his jean shorts. Oh shit heart starts pumping rapidly. Take a knee, open action of Mosin, load some cartridges into the sock I have on the butt stock. He looks up and sees me in the kneeling facing him handling the ammo. Quickly spins around, hops in his tow truck, and speeds off down the shifty desert road connecting the berms. Unload my gear but start hearing ricochets closely. Not sure if they were from other nearby shooters or if took a couple pot shots at me but I couldn't see him anymore and tore out of there. I think he might have wanted to steal my car or maybe it was a gang initiation or something, either way I'm glad I saved some ammo. Bought a handgun shortly after this and never went back alone. After the last two threads and pretty much every story on the internet being posted, Here's what a group of slash K slash Omandos should bring if you are actually crazy enough to hunt one of these things. Iron. Either knives, hatchets, or something similar. Silver buckshot. Wooden staff or spear made of Fraxinus Americana. Ash covered armor. Line said armor with scripture from a holy book if you are a believer. It probably doesn't matter what holy book as long as you believe. Shit you could probably use Stephen King's Dark Tower if you believe enough. Kosher salt. No reason not to. Something to mark the number of people in your group. Then here's what you do. Use the goddamn buddy system. Nobody is out of everyone's sight. However somebody's gotta be bait. Sleep in shifts. Constantly do a head count, a lot of the time people don't notice an extra person until they do a count or it's otherwise pointed out to them. If you think someone is taken or you count an extra person do the following. Spread ash and salt around the perimeter. Interrogate. Find out whose memories don't match up. Shoot the bastard. Go to slash k slash meetup. Greater than 10 ppl show up in total including myself. Do normal meetup shit and pound some beers towards the end. Weird guy starts doing head counts out loud and counts 9 not including himself. Starts asking everyone questions about activities we did throughout the day. Mentions that something called skinwalker is hiding among us. Everyone is kinda not paying much attention to him. Looks at me with fear. Brandish my pistol and say don't even think about it bro. Damn guy was a crazy schizo I think and I hope he never comes to a meetup again. Probably closer to slash out slash than slash k slash but what the hell. In a woods in Alaska, watching an almost never used bush airstrip over the summer, just a tent, fuel cache, and radio. No clue why they even have me there but pay is good. Gotta be by the radio 12 h a day but the other 12 I can sleep and do whatever. Pretty barren but some nice wood slash mountains a couple of hours walk away. Bears avoid me and the camp, lots of wolves about, 
howling around the sunset hours when the sun dips low. Wake up in terror one night, I've been shot at, had a gun held to my head, thought I would die more than once but this shit was worse, never felt this way. So terrified I can't even reach for the 12 GA next to me, finally after what seems like hours grab it, unload the bear banger I had chambered, add another slug to top it up. Finally start snoozing when I hear what sounds like dogs snarling, fighting then something like a yelp or scream. More sounds I can't even comprehend as they tear past my camp but something else has my attention. My whole cot is thudding as something massive runs past my tent, part of the frame on one side snaps but most holds thuds go off into the distance after the wolves. Go outside a bit later, electric bear fence posts ripped out of ground, wires broken where they snap tent frame. Patch everything up with duct tape and spare cables. Nothing unusual happens again except no wolves within two hours hike till the end of the season. Happy to get the hell out of there, pay was good but never again. My experience for you guys. Be me. 22 NDB day, taking hunting trip to northern NH. Set up shop at old logging cabin on load from a friend. Five of us, cleaning weapons, it's probably 11 PM, all drinking, and joking. Suddenly a thud hits the outside of the cabin, can't tell where exactly but it hits the wall, everyone freezes, looking at each other. Thud. Friend peers out the window. Thud. Friend winces away from the window, someone's throwing rocks at us, as he looks back out the window. Thud. Screw this guy another friend says and starts throwing his shotgun back together. Everyone gets the hint. We all start putting out weapons together hastily. Distribute rounds and shells, lock and load. Thud. We all burst out the front door yelling and hollering. We're going to mess your shit up, cut it out. Get the hell out of here, last chance. What the hell's your problem bundle of sticks? End up standing shoulder to shoulder facing the wood line. Rock comes sailing out of the woods and crashes through a window. We all shoulder our guns, and one pistol. Assorted shotguns, rifles, and a .45. Something smells like shit, we all kind of look at each other briefly. Another rock comes sailing at us, pistol and on fires warning shot up over the woods. Nothing, we stand there still shouldering our weapons. More nothing, smell is worse, like the ammonia of piss and shit. Bushes further back into the tree line rustle, tree branch snaps. One hell of a scream lets out of the wood line. Nope.com slash bear. All of us start shooting into the tree lean. Free landscaping and pruning. Run weapons empty, start reloading. Silence. Another rock sails towards the house, crashing into metal roof. All set with this shit to the SUV. Just start shooting in the general direction of the woods. I sprint over in lock cabin, my deposit, leave lights on. Friends still taking shots at the wood line. Pile into SUV and floor it back down the trail to the nearest town, get a motel room. Nope out the next day. Call owner on the way back, explain everything. Can't comprehend what I'm telling him. You mean to tell me something was throwing rocks at you and you shot at it? Yep. Gets mad thinks we might have murdered some poor chump. Mention the scream. Silence over the phone. Seems to change his tone, talks about neighbors across the other side of the logging area reporting similar things. Reports of tree knocking, rock throwing, and loud violent screaming. Says he will put a report into the sheriff. Days later I hear back from him. Sheriff reported similar instances that night of multiple locations having rocks thrown at their residences, screaming, and of course a report of a ton of gunfire in the middle of the night. Has no clue what it could have been. Deputy reported seeing something on the roadside resembling Bigfoot, was almost fired until other reports came through from locals. Still have no idea what happened that night and I'm never heading to Northern NH again whether it's Bigfoot, some dumbass kids, or whatever. We'll post town if inclined so you guys can try your luck. Be like next week after the first story. I have my two dogs with me right now, both Dobermans. Feel a lot safer, even though my dogs are wuss bags, I know they're good sound alarm systems and they'll wake me up if something's going on. Have been moving furniture all day, tired and sweaty, want to take a shower. Like I said, shower is outside. It's basically just a shed with concrete flooring and a show riad. It's next to my actual shed, and next to that is a large roofed area, 
large bar slash table, workshop-esque area. Start taking shower, it's warm outside, not so bad. Dogs start barking. Damn it, I don't know if they quite understand not to run into the street yet, people fly down the road I live on. GTFO of the shower, throw on clothes, yell for dogs. They're across the street already, shit. Yell for them to come back, they aren't responding, they're at the neighbor across the street's fence and won't come back. Have never seen that neighbor's house because he has so much land, but he has cattle. Walk across the street, telling dogs to shut up. Walk over hill. There's a cow on the ground, neck cut open, like huge wound, bleeding out everywhere, and it's still alive. What the hell? My dogs are barking at something past the cow but I don't know what, even though it's broad daylight I don't see anything. WTF 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 for a while, then just bring my dogs inside. I don't know how to tell the neighbor, walking to his house would take forever. Later, go up the street to put a note in his mailbox telling him what happened to his cow. Go to check on the cow. It's just gone. There's just a pile of blood. Post your UFO stories, I'll go first. Be me. 6th grade. Waiting for the bus. Probably like 5 a.m., still a bit dark outside. Searching for any stars left in the sky out of pure boredom. See something. It's some kind of white light in the sky. It's moving really fast. Watch as it flies behind a tree. Never see it come out the other side of the tree. This happened a long ass time ago, yet it still lingers in the back of my mind, could it have been a UFO? Or am I just silly and it was SMTH else? Maybe satellite flare or ball lightning. Satellite flare keeps a straight line and can appear to all at once take off from a standstill with rapid acceleration. Ball lightning is weird but I've seen it once, and apparently scientists are starting to accept it as a real phenomenon. Ball lightning is usually seen closer to Earth or in the immediate sky, the light is larger compared to a satellite flare and may sway or float through the air in a variable path. The one I saw was during a thunderstorm, and it dropped at a slight angle for a few seconds before it exploded into a full lightning bolt to the ground. Or it could be aliens, or you could be a silly Billy who saw his first shooting star. Probably the latter option. I've posted mine a few times before on slash x slash, but screw it. I'll post it one more time because I don't know if people read my shit. Early November, 2019. Work third shift so I drive to work when it's dark out. I drive through a sparsely populated part of Michigan, up in particular, so few traffic at night. Halfway through my commute to work I see a light hovering over the trees right next to the highway. As I drove by it, couldn't pull over sadly because I didn't want to be late for work, no room to pull over on the highway, and I wasn't sure if I could get a good phone picture, I saw that the light was roughly as big as a small house. The light pulsated in a slow rhythm and made no sound. There were also two other lights some distance from the big light also hovering parallel to the big light. Could have been a triangle craft admittedly, but there is no way I would know for sure because it was pitch black out. Drove past all the lights and never saw them again. Shit was bizarre. None of my other co-workers saw it because I was the only worker that drove that highway at that time. To start I've seen three different types of UFOs in Arizona from the years 2004 to 2014. The first type I saw looked like the Phoenix lights but they weren't in Phoenix. I live in Arizona City in my backyard with my family because they would show up almost daily. Normally we would be in our backyard facing south and the UFOs would show up west of us towards Tabletop Mountain over by Barry Goldwater Military Base. There would be anywhere from 7 14th of them that had a yellow color that would pop up and stay up for about an hour. The next type I saw were red balls of light that popped up at night just under the moon face south in my backyard. For about 15 minutes this orb would pulsate getting brighter and dimmer until finally it shot off into a beam of light. I saw one other pop up just like it about 5 to 10 minutes after the first one and do the same thing and shot off into a beam like the last one. The last one and the craziest one was the object with three light blue lights. You could make a triangle out of the lights if you drew slimes from each other. 
I again was in my backyard facing south and to my right in the open desert behind an elementary school near me I saw these three blue lights. It was about 200 feet in the air so real low, moving slowly and very silently. It slowly moved towards being directly adjacent from my backyard by about a thousand feet. So I ran through my house into the open desert. I got probably within a couple hundred feet of it and when I did it stopped moving completely. I could see that the shape of it was round but couldn't make out the material it was made out of and could see the blue lights on the bottom. I started to get scared so I slowly walked back and hear my my mom calling to me and walked towards her and told her. Be me, hanging out with wife and friend by the river bars in LJ. It's July 25th, 2020, 23 HRS, east lockdown so everybody's out. Heading back home, at the Dragon's Bridge traffic light. Wife says, Anon look up, what is that? Everybody at the traffic stop looks up in awe. Two big orbs of light are shining a very bright light in random directions to their sides, altitude around 200 meters coming from the castle hill towards the railway station. Their movement is aleatory, completely silent and they shine their light over the whole river and everything under them and sideways. The light they shine arcs in a cone, mostly to their sides. They fly next to each other but the distance separating them is not fixed, their movement isn't fixed either as they move in all directions as they shine their lights, their movement range is maybe 10,50m, hard to estimate. In awe we all stare at it for at least one or two minutes, I snap out and look at the crowd and we're all looking, there's maybe nine people there. Right there I remember I have a phone so I start recording, Pixel 2 XL, while on my bike, I cross the road to try to get ahead of the trees but the lights are already flying high. I stop recording to move to another area but the buildings don't allow me to see it. When I see the lights again, 100m ahead by the river, a couple of guys are also in awe looking up at the lights and we stay there watching and ruling out what they couldn't be. The lights kept going up higher than a plane that flew by, as they dimmed into space at a very high altitude. I have three I would call UFO stories, I guess. I have written about these on slash x slash before as well, nothing extremely interesting but ah well. When I was still in kindergarten slash preschool so maybe five to six years old, I vividly remember one morning when my mom was dropping me off and I happened to spot this metallic teardrop shaped thing in the sky slowly moving over the town. I watched it truck on for a little while but then I had to head inside, don't know what happened to it. This was in the mid-90s in Finland, so unlikely that it was a secret government plane or anything. Second UFO-ish thing was when I was around 11 to 12 so early 2000s, Dad woke me up one night to take a look at something. We watched from the porch as this dim red ball of light slowly hovered parallel to a ridgeline maybe 400 meters behind our house. It was completely silent, just hovered on until it was eventually obscured by trees further along the ridgeline. Never figured out what it was, nothing in the paper in the following week about it or anything. Third was when I was around 16, out one night just talking shit and walking with a friend when our attention was, for some reason, focused on this cluster of what looked like five stars in the night sky. Except that after a short while, all five shot off in different directions from each other, zero to one hundred and nothing flat. Spooked us a little, not gonna lie. Spooky green text thread, I'll start. Be me. Greater than 14 at the time. Big woods behind my house. Not many neighbors, fields, and woods all around. Nearest town is a mile west. Anyways. One day I decide to go for a walk in the woods. It's about twilight, but that's okay, because I like looking for owls and catching fireflies. Start walking on trail back to woods get to woods. Stay on trail, darker now so have flashlight on. Make it about one third of the way through the woods, before hearing a blood curdling scream. Stop dead in my tracks. Not unusual to hear woods noises, but never heard a scream like that. Whole woods is fucking silent, except for quiet breeze and a few leaves rustling. Slowly begin walking again. Now about one halfway into the woods, start feeling okay again. I pass by one of our trail markers, and right as I do, something steps out of the bush about 60 feet in front of me. Stop dead in my tracks again. This thing is completely silent, 
didn't even make noise when it came out of the bushes. I take one step forward. It looks at me. It begins stepping towards me. Big huge damn thing, about 8 feet tall, thin as hell and looks like what can only be described as a mix between Stripe the Gremlin, a Fresno Nightcrawler, and a Land Strider from the Dark Crystal. I begin to step back, shitting myself. It stops about 3 foot from me and cranes its neck, starts sniffing me. Freeze, shaking. It sniffs me and grunts for a few minutes before it lets out a loud snarf sound and pulls away. It begins walking away but as it does I reach out and touch its leg. Feels like leather, not like reptile skin, but like a leather belt. It walks back into the bush silently again and disappears. Shit myself more and run all the way back, don't stop until I get to the garage. What the hell did I run into? I've actually ran into something quite similar once. Be me. Greater than 10 yo at the time. Greater than 2 am, dogs barking, and they won't shut up. Go outside to tell them to be quiet. See something in the corner of my eye. Turn to look at it, it's some big ass humanoid creature crawling on the fence, has super long limbs and shit. Get super freaked out. Thing looks back at me, and skitters up a nearby tree. Start bawling my fucking eyes out, go to tell my mom but she doesn't believe me, tells me to go back to bed. Still can't tell if I was just hallucinating, or what I saw was legit lol. More true crime than paranormal but hey here you go. Be me. Greater than 15, American. Go to rich private school in desert state. School is super old, used to be a catholic church. Main office is still there but chapel is not. Rumors ABT there being a cemetery on grounds. Get curious, decide to do digging. Turns out church has been there for decades. Definitely cemetery on shoalgrounds. Avi. Do more digging. Find old photo of church in late 1950. See off to side, gravestones. Jackpot. Wait until weekend and make my move, grab a few friends and make our way to school. Live in middle of nowhere desert, super cold at night. Get to school and head over to where gravestones were in photo. Turns out it's on the soccer field. Where so screwed if we get caught. Start digging. Had to stop a few times BC cops but eventually we dig deep enough until one of us puts his shovel in and we hear it. Crack. We just broke a fucking femur. Oh we are so cursed. Two of us get rowdy. Cops come back due to noise. Book it. Get to school next week. Police tape around hole. Hear announcement in homeroom that detectives will be coming by to talk to us and ask us questions. Rumors going around that they think bones are recent. Thinking I'm going to go to jail for whatever my 15 year old brain thought, had mega anxiety at the time. Nothing happens until a month later. School cancelled out of the blue. WTF OK day off. Have friend whose mom works in admin office. Hears that detectives are talking to Dean almost daily. No school for whole week. Walk by campus to see what's going on. Hear what sounds like a fucking construction site where we were digging. Meet with admin office mom friend later. Tells me feds are involved. Feds basically excavating field. School went back to normal next week. Field was back to normal. Students who ask immediately suspended. No sign of Dean. Years later find out he murdered a student and was arrested. School hushed it up. Not sure if this counts since it's not over the top, but I'll throw it in anyways. B12. Sharing my phone with my mom since she broke hers. There are times where I have to give it to her at night for a reason I can't really remember anymore. Never really offer to give it to her, she has to ask. One day I'm tired of it and just mumble to myself do I give it to her tonight. Get a very audible don't in response. Voice sounded feminine but regardless I'm freaked out. Run to my parents room to tell them what happened. My mom says she doesn't need my phone and that it was probably just my conscience speaking to me. Know for a fact that that's bullshit, but leave it be. There's also another instance that happened in the same house that was just as brief. Come out of my bedroom and go downstairs for whatever reason. 
Right next to my bedroom is a bathroom. See the back heel of a foot enter the bathroom and close the door behind it. Assume it's my mother or brother. Go downstairs and see that they're both down there. Get confused, tell them what I saw and go back to check the bathroom. Open the door and see that it's dark and no one is in there. Be confused as hell. Not me but this was my dad's story before he passed, he was in a field working for his uncle. Be him plowing a field by a drop off towards a creek. Sees a hut that looks like a sweat lodge. Steps out of the plower because he hears animals coming from the sweat lodge like a bear, eagle, wolf, every animal you could name in the northern hemisphere. Hears what is coming from this dinky little hut and says screw this. Goes to tell his uncle and his face goes flush, tells him it's a good thing he never went inside or went any closer. Says it's bad Indian magic. They decide to investigate the next morning, the next morning three cows are dead on uncle's farm. Uncle doesn't say anything other than let's go investigate the sweat lodge my dad seen the other day. When they arrive there is nothing but a circle where the sweat lodge would have been. Uncle says never to tell anybody of what he has seen or heard coming from that place. Dad eventually tells me about because I was curious. I'm scared now brothers what do if bad Indian magic happens. Not spooky or paranormal, actually. Be me. Once again it's Sunday and I'm at workplace. As usual, basically alone in the whole building. Place is kind of far and pretty quiet, here and there a car passes nearby. Sometimes it is possible to hear birds chirping. Sit near some large clear windows, my back towards them. Again, usual. Things go by smoothly, silence reigns, normal. Nearing end of shift. Hear a muffled loud thump from behind me. Instantly looks backwards. Nothing. I think some large flyer crashed in that window, that day. A hawk, perhaps? Since it was on the second floor, maybe it fell down right after, got my heart thumping for several minutes afterwards. I have one, I used to live in Tucson until I moved to Wyoming. This is the reason I moved, and why I'm a shut in now as this left me with some serious trust issues. B23 at the time. Arizona boy born and raised. Have two close friends. The survivalist type nerd will call G. Hipster Mac photo nerd with a hard on for paranormal will call age. During high school we used to break into old abandoned buildings for fun. We ended up going our separate ways after HS. I moved to Tucson because I ended up working for the AZ Department of Corrections when I flunked out of college. Ended up living a quiet life in an APT. A while after I turned 23, both friends decided to visit before they started their lives. H gives us the idea to travel to Tombstone to camp. After some sweet talking G and I agree. We load up our 4x4s with needed camping equipment. G brought his AR and I had my AK and we both brought our plate carriers. After some driving we get to where H is happy to set up camp. A few abandoned adobe structures are nearby. We set up camp with my jeep facing the fire pit since we planned on using my running lights as illumination later that evening. Spend rest of the afternoon shooting, with H taking photos with a few her Oper 8R shots thrown in for giggles. Night falls and we start our fire. General Dickery, Spooky Stories, Catching Up. H's Army BF getting deployed. G and I secretly happy because this bastard is literally the H2-1A trip scum if he enlisted. Total pog. G got set up with a dot job that pays well. Suddenly running lights die. God damn it. Figured it's probably the battery, good thing I packed a spare. After some fooling around wire up the new battery. Still nothing. Damn. Friend tries his truck. It won't turn over. Double crap. Welp, we're not going anywhere might as well pack it in for the night. The three of us pile into the tent. G is a little spooked so to calm him down I told him we'd take shifts on watch. Greater than three hour shifts starting with me. G falls asleep cuddling his AR. Sit there thinking to myself. A nice breeze is going, so the tent's rustling a bit. Get to that soul searchy part and zone out hard. 
come back to after an hour and just try to keep myself entertained for another hour. Shift ends and I wake up G at round 1. I crawl into my sleeping bag and nod off. Get woken up 3 hours later. G says everything's all good so far. Do my shift. 4 colon 45 am. Wind dies. Doesn't fade. Just stops. Hair stands up. Hear what appears to be footsteps circling tent. At first think it's just an animal. After a while figure out it's only two feet. Someone is outside the tent. Defcon 2. Wake G. Inform him of current situation. He sits bolt upright, AR at the ready. We sit there until sunrise. Footsteps just stop. No fading into the distance. They stop in front of the tent. H has slept through the whole thing. G and I are exhausted but tell H nothing. Jeep and truck still won't stop. G and I contemplate humping it the 20 miles to civilization for some help but H talks us out of it. Spend whole morning fucking with our vehicles trying to fix them. Literally everything is in working order. African American friend what? G gets his truck to work somehow. Figure we should look around before leaving. Check out the adobe structures nearby. Nothing too serious. We take more photos. By the time we're ready to head back the sun has gone down again. G and I are instant spooked even though it's a couple hundred yards walk back to camp. G takes point because he has a huge lamp on the front of his AR. H is the middle and I bring up the rear. We keep walking. G stops. We all stop. A half second later a fourth step stops. There are three of us. G looks at me and I look at him and H looks like she'll shit herself. G immediately bolts towards camp. I pick H up, who is about 50 pounds wet, and follow him. Panic mode. Get back to camp. Jeep gone. Truck gone. Camp wrecked. Defcon 0. G tells us that there's a semi-decent adobe structure back where we came. Should hold up there for the night and bail at first light. Don't even argue with him just sprint the 200 odd yards with H over my shoulder. Finally get there. Kick door in. Get H inside and pull G in with me. Sit H in the middle of the room. We barricade the door with an old wood burning stove. Sit in the middle facing outward. See shadow pass around windows. These windows are entirely open and have no glass. If this thing wants us it can get us. It eventually climbs in on G's side. G panics and tries to get a round off. Jam, FTF. I come about and try to fire too. Jam, FTF. Immediately know this thing is a skinwalker. An aggressive one too. Grab H and bail out the window. G has tried two times to shoot this thing and his AR has jammed both times. Grab him by the hood of his jacket and pull him through the window. G and I attempted to fire multiple times at this thing and we had FTF every single time. We eventually lost it. Pretty sure it just gave up. Get into Tombstone. Get a motel room. We didn't sleep. The three of us stayed in all day, showered, and just tried to forget what happened. We get a bus back to our respective towns and G and H go back home before starting their work. Got very little sleep for the next two weeks. Got a decent rental car to replace my Jeep. H's mom calls me. Tells me H never came home, thought I would know something. Tell her everything that happened. She hangs up in hysterics. Two hours later, G's dad calls, wants to know why G isn't home. Again tell him everything. Get an earful from him and this better not be a prank. Promise him it's not. He hangs up in rage. Immediately know what happened to them. Grab Bob. Grab AK and PC. Leave everything. Phone. Cut up credit cards. Dispose all but my essential papers, SS, birth certificate, etc. 
Call landlord from payphone and tell him that I'm leaving and he can find the key where I hid it, all my stuff is his to sell. Hump and hitchhike my way north. End up in Wyoming. Investigated by police. They never found the vehicles, G, or H. Parents disown me over it. Put four deadbolts on my new app door. Do everything remotely possible to stave off skinwalkers. Get very little sleep since. Keep AK in reaching distance at all times and avoid going near windows. I'm 28 now, I have no friends, no social media connections of any kind. I just go to work, and home, that's it. The move was the worst, it took me three months to trek my way here, and I was in constant fear for my life because I knew they were looking for me. I carry everywhere and at one point experimented with hand loads designed to take down skin walkers, but that turned out to be fruitless. Don't mess around with skin walkers.